they were pinned down from a dishka and the uh, heavy machine gun. And the dishka was coming from the third story of a seven story apartment building. And they were pinned down into like this rock wall and it was just busting out the wall. And I could see in the target pod, I could see muzzle flashes and I could see it, you know, busting out the wall. And the JTAC, and I, I could hear it in the background. Uh, he said, we need to get this thing, you know, taken care of. Calling with heading expect clearance on final. Like, yep, you know, dude's in uh, 180, clear hop. So we ended up, uh, dropping and then we blew that third story out within like maybe a minute and a half or two minutes of getting that nine line. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I served war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear a fascinating combat story from an active duty and currently serving F-15 Eagle fighter pilot, Ryan Stinger Fischel, who's been involved in some of the most recent combat operations we've talked about on the show, including Syria and Iraq in Operation Inherent Resolve fighting ISIS. Ryan has an absolutely remarkable story of how he found his way to the Air Force that included a Forrest Gump-like path of hustling and fighting for any flight time he could get in the civilian world to include incredibly risky and sketchy flights shuttling aircraft from the U.S. to various countries in the Caribbean. At one point, Ryan was living out of his car and working in a grocery store deli before a moment on a beach changed his perspective on life entirely. I would ask you to please listen through Ryan's story to get to the cockpit because it makes what follows, his exploits inside the aircraft, so much more special. To include an air-to-air shootdown in hostile skies, a standoff and near international incident with a Russian fighter, and dropping danger close ordnance literally in neighboring buildings as friendlies were fighting ISIS. I'm so excited for you to hear one of our best combat stories with insight into the fighter pilot community I'd never heard of before from a longtime combat story listener himself and active duty pilot, and hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. Ryan, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us. Awesome to be here. Thanks. I was uh, I was hoping you could share how we came to to meet each other because it's very rare, as you know, to have somebody on the show who who's still in the middle of their service, who, who's done their time downrange, but still has more to go. Um, so I, I'd just love for you to share uh, just some context behind that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, some military podcasts and moreover, listen to people's uh, individual stories. And uh, I came across your podcast just as a like suggestion um, combat story and had been listening to it uh, pretty religiously for about, uh, you know, a couple of years or so. And uh, I thought it was just absolutely awesome. And the people on there were great. And the stories, how personal they were and a lot, of, you know, how open people were about stuff. And I had in some ways related to, you know, some of the people on the show and just sometimes uh, some of the events that they talked about, like I was there, you know, either in the air or not or, or around or whatever. And it was it was kind of a cool kind of brotherhood sort of thing. So appreciate that. And I didn't realize that we were in a similar email thread group. Um, and, uh, and it was cool hearing your story uh, as well. So, uh, so yeah, I was, and, you know, connected, I guess, uh, through that. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm just super excited to be on the show, to be honest. Oh man. We're so happy to have you. And yeah, we're, we're on this um, on a forum where we kind of talk with a lot of people. So tons of people in this forum, but just talking about things that are going on national, international affairs type work. Um, but it was funny when you reached out, one of the things you said that I just, that caught my eye, you said, if you ever want to hear exaggerated combat tales from a slightly below average fighter pilot, let me know. I was like, this sounds like exactly what we want to hear. So thanks again for reaching out, man. I'm so excited uh, to talk to you. And I, I am genuinely thankful that you've been listening over you know past year or two. I know one of the things personally I regret is that I didn't invest more in understanding what other people had gone through um, while I was serving. I wish that I had read more. You know, we didn't ha- have podcasts the same way you do today in this forum, but I just wish I had read more on it to learn more from other people's mistakes and experiences. So it sounds like you're taking advantage of that, which I'm jealous of. Yeah, I was super happy about that because the um, when we had done a lot of close air support and everything, 
um, we connected with the guys on the ground in more of a kinetic capacity, but then hearing their individual stories and what they were doing and what, what it was like to uh, be on the ground and, um, you know, either benefit from uh, close air support or not, or facilitate whatever mission there was, I, I thought it was really awesome. And, and it's key for, for us to, in order to be able to employ a little bit better, I think it's absolutely critical that we try to get their perspective more, you know, the more that we can is probably the better. I, I agree entirely. And Pete, you may have heard me talk about this, but like I I really sought out chances to understand the ground guys, just how they were going to move on a target, you know, what they were looking for, how we can make it easier for them. Cause that's, that's where all the work gets done. Like how can we just make their life easier some way? So I hear you. Um, one thing I have not picked up yet is your call sign. So I think we got to <laughs> start there. What, uh, what do you go by? Uh, so my call sign is Stinger. Um, and that comes That's a from a good uh, one, man. Well, <laughs> so usually the, the good ones have like the, a story behind them that doesn't really, you know, it's, it's kind of an inside joke sort of thing. Um, so if it sounds really good, usually there's a, there's a story there that that's probably pretty embarrassing. Uh, and, and mine is, but it's not really family friendly, <laughs> uh, for the show. It's something that, you know, we get a few beers or whatever, and I'm happy to, happy to tell you all about it. But as far as like, you know, family stuff, it's like, uh, I think you interviewed a guy whiz, you know, right. Yep. Yeah. His was a lot more family friendly, um, from, from that, uh, call sign perspective. So, and, and also it, some of the, um, some of the air force call signs are, are a lot different than the Navy call signs. Navy. I feel like they just name people that whatever comes to mind, they just throw a name out and it is what it is. And the air force kind of I don't know, they try to find a cool sounding name sometimes, and sometimes it's usually based off a really bad story. So uh, that's where, you know, if we get together for some beers in real life, you're, I'll tell you all about it. Got it. Yeah. When we're not on air, I hear you. Yeah, We've yeah, all exactly. got stuff we can't talk about on the air. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things I, and we're going to, I want to hear about how you found your way to, to fly. But one of the things I just wanted to touch on that I noticed when I was, I was looking at your background you mentioned being both a fighter pilot and a flight weapons systems officer. Mm -hmm. Before we get down the road of like why you chose what you did, what is the difference between those? Uh, yeah, so for the Air Force, the like the fighter um, weapon system officer uh, for the F-15E uh, sits in the back seat, and um, there's uh, two distinct roles that really go on. So. Uh, for the F-15E, you have the pilot who sits in the front seat, uh, and then you have the wizard who sits in the back seat. And the back seat is primarily concerned with either talking to JTACs or facilitating weapons deliveries or uh, targeting weaponeering. And mostly you're just a weapons expert on the jet. And then you're trying to sink as much uh, in the way of effects and combat effects that you can um, while you're not really consumed with the duties of flying the aircraft. So it, it's an interesting job uh, and it's really cool, um, especially in a cast role. Um, you're just, usually you just build a lot of SA and then uh, you're able to coordinate with multiple different agencies all at the same time and try to sync effects in. And then you're weaponeering, you know, specific bombs in the specific locations and timing stuff and everything else. And then you're coordinating that with the pilot in the front seat to be able to um, deliver that either as a formation uh, uh, or just single ship. So that's pretty it's, much a weapon system officer, I guess. Yeah. And, and then what about the front seat? Maybe it sounds self-explanatory, but what's, what's the difference there? It sounds like you just named all the things that go on in the cockpit, but there's a whole nother person in there, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, from the front seat, um, mostly you're concerned about, uh, geometry, uh, with the jet. So putting the jet where it needs to be, uh, and energy management for the jet, as well as, generally and like traditionally in the strike community uh, at least the front seat does a lot more of the air to air role of the aircraft and then the weapon system officer will do the air to ground role uh, and so for the strike eagle, you can do those both at the same time uh, so often for um, whether it's like interdiction type strikes or not uh, or whatnot we'll go in and the weapon system officer will start targeting stuff on the ground whether it's columns of tanks or boats or it's buildings and you'll start designating on stuff, finding targets, allocating weapons for those while uh, the pilot is executing an air to air commit 
while you're shooting missiles at uh, you know other aircraft and stuff, you're working a ground game so that you can get into a launch acceptability reason or a LAR and be able to pickle those bombs off. So we've worked a lot in this regular community to get to a, uh, basically to maneuver in the middle of an air to air fight to get to a air to ground release solution to be able to do both kind of at the same time. So fight your way in and then, you know, bomb stuff and then fight your way back out is kind of the bread and butter of that community. So. Awesome. That's mm -hmm. super interesting. Okay. And then I don't want to put you in a tough spot here. So if you got to <laughs> deflect, go for it. Go for it. What's yeah. the, is it safe to say that the fighter pilot side of the equation is more sought after? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's true. Um, and it's, there's nothing, you know, in my opinion, since now, you know, experienced in both seats, I would say that like the, the front seat of a fighter is, or the only, you know, single seat of a fighter or whatever, uh, is such a cool place to be. Uh, and it's not that the back seat isn't at all. It's just that the front seat is you're moving the jet where you want to. And especially if you do BFM or like dog fighting, it is just awesome, you know, to be able to do it and, and to be a pilot and to fly. Um, but um, from the tactical side of the things, the Wizzo is actually um, a lot of times making more stuff happen. And Wizzos oftentimes are, they're kind of unsung, I would say unsung heroes for a lot of things. Um, they are kind of the, the these tactical, uh, you know, symphony conductors, uh, you know, as it were that that are making a lot of different things happen behind the scenes and, and they really get into the weeds on tactics. Um, now pilots do obviously as well, but the, but the whistles are, are really experts in that and they're experts in weaponeering. So on the outside, when you're looking in for like a recruiting poster or whatever, you see the person and whether you're flying a single seat jet, whether it's an F-35 or F-22, um, you don't really see the things that a F-15E Wizzo, you know, does uh, in in that role. But uh, but there's a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I personally, uh, you know, I love the front seat. Um, but I flew um, prior, at, you know, flew as a pilot prior to the Air Force. So I kind of always, I if you want to say, identified as a pilot, or, you know, what whatever. Um, that's sort of where I found myself. But I really, really infatuated with the tactical side of it, um, which was uh, more of the, uh, you know. A lot in the Wizzo side, so got it. And you mentioned uh, your time before. So, would would your parents or friends, when you were a kid, have been surprised to hear that you grew up to be a, a fighter pilot? Uh, I don't think so. I well, yes and no. I think that, <laughs> um, I think that a lot of people um, are surprised that it actually happened. Um, but nobody was surprised that I wanted to, if that makes sense. So it, it does, but why do you say that? Why do you say that they might be surprised it actually happened? Um, it was just it, it, the way that like my, uh, growing up in life story, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff happened. It, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't the most promising child, I guess, out there, if that makes sense, especially around about the college freshman, you know, side of things. So, I mean, are you saying that you had like a, a dark side, mischievous side? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, of course, uh, <laughs> you know, an anti-authority side, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so um, that plays out late, uh, later on. But yeah, I, I uh, the, the, you know, beginning part of, you know, your, your high school, you know, time and all that sort of stuff. It, um, cause I, I failed a lot growing up, I would say. Um, and a lot of it was self-induced failure, obviously, <laughs> um, but failed a lot and a lot, and then just kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. Uh, and then got yeah, some, definitely some lucky breaks. Um, but, uh, but usually had a, a ton of hard work to try to make things happen, you know? I mean, that sounds, I, I think, probably counterintuitive for most people who think of the path to being a fighter pilot is a pretty tight rope to walk. Like you have to do a lot of things right. Um, was it maybe you failed at these other things, as you said, but like you had this passion to go this one direction. You were just weren't going to miss that opportunity. Yeah, th there was there was several like little key events that kind of happened along life and uh I'd gotten to a point really where I didn't want to look back on life, you know, get to be 
probably the age I am now, you know, and then look back and say, I could have done that if I worked my hardest to do it. Um, but I didn't. Um, so I wanted to just say, you know what, screw it. Like we're going, you know, balls to the wall and we're just going to make this happen no matter what. Um, and, and, and it wasn't an easy road. Um, and I'll tell you that, like, I would work really, really hard uh, to get an opportunity. I would get the opportunity and then I would blow the opportunity. And then I'll have to start over and work super duper hard and then get an opportunity, blow it and then work hard again. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I wouldn't say I was, you know, the smartest kid on the block for sure, but yeah. Man. Um, it, and it, it looks like you didn't have the, I don't know if it's traditional, like the academy path to sitting in a fighter pilot seat. Uh, nope. Um, I ended up going OTS, um, from that. So what is OTS for people who, oh yeah, sorry. It's so it's also a training school. Uh, so yeah, like, um, there's three basic, uh, commissioning sources out there. You got the Academy, you know, for the Air Force, the Air Force Academy, obviously. And then you have ROTC, um, which is, you know, coincident with college. And then you have OTS, which is kind of like post-college, you, you have a degree already, um, and, uh, and I really didn't get a great degree. Um, I got a degree in uh, business from an online community college, a uh, four-year degree. And uh, it just so happened that um, whatever luck happened on the AFOQT, which is the Air Force officers qualifying test, like I got a decent score on that and then got some, some other, you know, other things went on. But, um, but yeah, I mostly got really lucky a couple of times. Um, so, man. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of interesting. The, uh, I went from, I guess, growing up and I, I don't want to bore you too much with the, no man, this is why we're talking with the growing this up the details, path. you know, but, uh, but yeah, so, um, you know, I'm from Florida. Uh, and so, um, my, uh, my parents were pretty, pretty strict, you know, super religious, really into their church. And, um, so we grew up in a pretty strict household, um, we also had a lot of cool uh, opportunities, I would say, where our parents would um, lock us out of the house, uh, and then we would be forced to uh, to ride our bikes in the neighborhood, and we'd be forced to meet other kids, and you know, blaze trails through the woods, and you know, collect banana spiders, and do all this sort of stuff that you know kids did. And so we had a, a really cool imagination. Um, I think that built out of like creating your own. Um, you know, your own afternoon time without anything to preoccupy you, which is, which is kind of cool. And, um, I had a friend, uh, who lived probably a couple streets down and, uh, his parents were in the church as well. And he, uh, his brother was a recon Marine, a uh, force recon Marine. And, uh, he would come back every once in a while, you know, and, uh, we would just sit there as, you know, 14, 15 year old, just listening to his stories about going to, you know, Japan and Thailand and, you know, all these places. And he was, you know, skydiving with dogs in Australia one day and do, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. So we, we, uh, we got into, uh, reading a lot and it was reading all these, uh, journals and diaries of, uh, people, whether it was in Vietnam or post-Vietnam, and, uh, you know, some different types of books. And um, my grandfather actually was, uh, he was in the Air Force, but he was a, he was enlisted for four years during the Korean War time. And uh, whenever we would go to his house, he had a bunch of books in his library, and they were all journals of fighter pilots. And he was really into aviation being a, a, an Air Force guy. And he was into building model airplanes, and he had a private pilot's license, and he was a, um, he was an engineer for Pratt and Whitney at the time. So we had kind of this uh, natural connection to aviation through my grandfather and then a natural connection to the military through him, as well as through our friend who was the uh, force recon Marine. So uh, I pretty much just collected all these journals of all these fighter pilots and just read them, you know, couldn't get enough of it. And, um, the uh my my friend who had the force recon marine uh, brother um would uh would hand me books too like that we had a book called sog by john plaster i don't know if you yeah, yeah. you know about the yep. which is just 
fascinating because these guys were such out of the container thinkers, you know, and they, they were awesome. And um, we read another book called The Company They Keep about the Green Berets and then, uh, you know, the, the Q course and Robin Sage and all this sort of stuff. And it was just this cool, um, you know, land uh, and, and, and kind of where we saw or where I saw at least like a future in, you know, eventually. So um, we kind of fast forward a little bit to uh, get involved with a civil air patrol, which is like this uh, kind of JROTC sort of thing that does like search and rescue and everything. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. You fly, right? I mean, yeah, you fly. Uh, so I got a chance to fly a little bit with them, which is, which is awesome. Um, and then um, I ended up um, getting a, uh, a scholarship into Air Force RTC. Uh, so it was like, my path is laid out for me. I'm going to go be a fighter pilot. Like this is house and I'm going to go to a test pilot school and I'm, you know, all this stuff. Right. So the scholarship was contingent on taking a, um, on being an aerospace engineering major. And, um, I am not good at math, like, at, like at all. So maybe that wasn't the right major for me. Um, so anyway, I went in very optimistically and, um, got morning registered for morning classes, which I found out was like a huge mistake in college. Um, and, uh, and they were all, uh, classes that had like, um, attendance was in your grade, you know, um, which was just the worst for me because I was terrible. I was terrible at math and I was terrible at time management. Uh, so like between all those things, it was just doomed. So I did the first semester of RTC. Uh, I was kind of like, man, uh, I'm not really hundred percent sure with, you know, all these people out there and, um, and then I pretty much flunked out of, um, Embry Riddle, uh, at the time. So I had like a 0.8 GPA or something like that. Like it was like just the worst. Um, and I was working at the time as well. Um, uh, and, and it was just, I was just not good at any of this stuff and I didn't really know how to study and all that sort of chess. So, um, my parents deeply disappointed, uh, kind of an embarrassment really to the family, you know, with all this <laughs> stuff. So they, uh, they bring me back in the house and they say, Hey, listen, um, you can stay here, but you're going to have to pay like $400 a month rent. You know what I mean? And you're going to have to work and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, great. About that time, uh, some of my buddies and I had, um, made a, uh, a super awesome potato gun, um, that we had designed on CAD, which was the only cool thing that I grasped out of the engineering thing. And we went to a, um, a dry lake bed. Apparently it was somebody's property. I didn't know that at the time. And we got arrested for armed trespassing. So, which is a felony, oh, by the way, in Florida. Um, and so we got asked if we were training terrorists and like, there was this whole thing with the cops and all, all. anyways, the judge heard it and was like, wait a minute, you guys said you had a potato gun and you got arrested for armed trespassing. That's ridiculous you know i'm going to drop this down or whatever if you guys do some community service i was like okay that sounds great anyways uh so i had a rest on my record i had a 0.8 gpa and then i was living at my parents house you know and then part of their rules were that um you know you had to go to church every sunday and or twice every sunday uh and all this you know other stuff and i said well you know i need to buy a car and i ended up buying this like 87 BMW for like 1200 bucks. And, um, I decided that I needed to work more than, uh, follow the rules, you know, in my parents' house or whatever. And so they kicked me out, uh, because I, I worked on Sunday instead of going to church. Um, so I didn't really have anywhere to go. So I lived in my car, um, for a couple months. And at that time I had gotten a job at a Publix deli, like wrapping like people's meat and stuff. Can I pause you for one second? Yeah, you bet. Just a quick word from our sponsor, Cran Eater Coffee, that you won't want to miss, and we'll get right back to this combat story. For those who have been downrange, you know that coffee is a critical component of any day. It's one of the few things to actually look forward to. And some of you know that I drink coffee for the first half, at least, of every interview, and it remains a key part of my day. We're proud to support Cran Eater Coffee coming to you from, you guessed it, some former Marines, their families, and members of the law enforcement community. They know all too well what it takes and the special people on both sides of the coin downrange and at home, where we all know the family members that support us don't get enough 
enough credit. Crayon Eater Coffee is 100% Arabica coffee, masterfully roasted from over 20 years of research and development with unique flavor mixes that represent the craziness of our lives and the greatness of how the unique family blend can be. When Crayon Eaters mix with coffee, something unique and incredible is bound to brew up. You can get yours now at crayoneatercoffee.com and use promo code combat story, all one word. So that's crayoneatercoffee.com. So C-R-A-Y-O-N-E-A-T-E-R coffee. Dot com. Use promo code combat story to get 10% off your purchase and start your colorful day off on a bright note with Crayon Eater Coffee. And now back to this combat story. First of yeah. all, I'm, you know, I went to high school in Florida and I yeah. love music publics. Now, <laughs> how, tell me, so you, you kind of, you, you read these journals, these books, you had these aspirations, you had this path, ROTC, um, then you're living in, in your car. Yeah. Dude, how are you feeling at that time? Yeah, not great, but uh, <laughs> especially because it was super humid there. And I specifically remember all the mosquitoes that were getting in the car and stuff. And I don't know if anybody's ever like tried to sleep in a car for more than a week at a time, but it is not super comfortable, especially if it's a two door car. Um, but, but anyways, do what you got to do. And um, I had decided that, you know what, what else am I going to do? I, I need to come up with a plan that gets me somewhere. And the plan is you're going to have to work and you're going to have to work really hard and you're going to have to save up a lot of money and you're going to have to re-enroll in some school that will actually take you. So th that, that was the, that was kind of like the goal. And I'm not sure, I didn't really give myself a timeline on that, but I said, you know what, I'm going to do my best to be able to make this happen. So I had, um, worked at Publix in the deli and, um, um, started, I don't know, making friends with some of the other people in there. And, and, uh, one dude, um, said, Hey, you know, you're welcome to like sleep on my couch if you want to, you know, it's like, well, that's awesome. Cause you have a shower too and stuff, you know? And I was like pretty nasty cause it was, was using the shower at the, at, you know, the Publix in the break room, you know, like, oh, just, it was just not great. Um, you know, not a great lifestyle, but, um, but anyways, I had, done that for a little bit. And as I was living in my car, I, I wasn't getting mail, uh, at the time and I didn't have a cell phone. And I guess the, uh, part of the whole, um, what they call a deferred prosecution agreement for that, uh, arrest that I told you about, um, they had like a $50 fee or something like that to the state attorney's office. And I didn't pay that. Um, I didn't even know I had to, I'm not even sure if I had the money to, but um, they, it was a, um, breach of a deferred prosecution agreement, which triggered an arrest warrant. So I was, uh, I had been called to like bag groceries or, you know, come to the front to bag groceries or whatever. So I'm bagging groceries, you know, putting somebody's bread in a plastic bag and the cops roll in and, uh, I get cuffed in the middle of Publix and then, you know, take it to a jail. So the, the friend that I met, um, and, uh, they had, uh, raised money to bail me out, <laughs> So I got bailed out and I talked to the, you know, courthouse and everything. I said, Hey, listen, I'm super sorry. I, this was a circumstance. If I pay this fee, you know, can we call it good and everything? And they said, yeah, fine, whatever. Uh, so that they were able to, uh, get that all worked, you know, um, the only problem is that when the Florida department of law enforcement filed that they filed it as a felony arrest, which obviously, as you know, creates a whole host of problems. If you're, you know, trying to get into government service later on down the road anyways. So, uh, so yeah. Um, but my, uh, so through the friend at Publix, his name was Ryan Bader, who's just an outstanding guy. Um, he had introduced me to some other people who said, Hey, we, we can like, you can live at our house on the couch a little bit more permanently. You know, if you throw some money at us for like utilities and everything, and they had a single mom who was working like 12 hours a day as a nurse, you know, and everything. And I was, I just couldn't be more excited to like live somewhere, you know, live somewhere with running water and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, so I did that for a while. I made, they were just outstanding friends and we, we developed a bond and it was awesome. And, um, they said, Hey, we're, we're ocean lifeguards, uh, during the summer, you should come out, you know, and try to qualify and everything. And I've been surfing and swimming my whole life. So I was, it was pretty natural. Uh, and so qualified and started doing a sort of becoming a ocean lifeguard. 
and then working at the Publix Deli and then had shifted to becoming a prep cook, uh, taking like a third job as a prep cook at a local restaurant, you know, and stuff at, like early in the morning, try to bounce like three jobs. Uh, and then later on became a bartender, you know, a server and bartender, et cetera, at night um, so that I could raise money to go to go to college. And the lifeguarding was awesome. Uh, I loved it. Like I loved, you know, being out there and swimming and it was an ocean lifeguard. So you had a, um, you know, it got to be challenging and stuff. And, and there was one instance while I was ocean lifeguarding that I, I would say changed um, my perspective on life and some other things. And that was, I had just been newly qualified. Like I had just got through the training and you get to a point where you can sit on a tower by yourself, you know, and, and they trust you. And I remember talking to, I was sitting on a tower and it was in, they put you on the, like almost no, the, the place on the beach where like nobody, you know, comes so that you're, you can, you know, you're a noob and you're not really that good and stuff. So you're not going to get in any trouble. So I'm out there and, you know, get up there and I think I'm real, you know, hot shit and stuff on this lifeguard tower and there's girls walking by, you know, we're talking and stuff. And I ended up talking to this uh, one chick and, um, we're talking for a little bit and out of the corner of my eye, I see, uh, two kids, um, like playing in the waves and didn't really think much of it at all. And there's like, okay, well, there's two kids playing in the waves, you know, comp just like, I could not have been more naive to what was going on. And, um, they actually were getting pulled out by a rip and they started to drown and they were actively drowning. It was within the first 30 minutes that I was alone on this tower for the first time. And, um, a guy who is near my tower, who's on the beach, just took off running and he pulled those kids out. Um, and he saved their, those kids' lives while I sat there on the tower and just watched. And that hit me like a ton of bricks afterwards because um, it was the, one of the most humbling times like in my entire life um, of saying that, you know, I had a responsibility and I wasn't able to execute that responsibility. And I'm thankful that this person was there to be able to actually do my job for me. And he wasn't even, you know, he wasn't a lifeguard. He wasn't even paid or anything. And uh, that, that I carried with me for, you know, the rest of my life, basically as a motivation of like, you know, you have to take action when things happen and, like you have to be the one that does stuff, if that makes sense. Um, so, so that was that, that kind of definitive, you know, point in time anyways. Um, that, that's super interesting, right? Like, I, I don't even know how the hell you're in an aircraft at this point. I'm like, what happens in your <laughs> life? So it makes sense. Like you have this uh, pretty defining moment. I, I hear it. it. You can tell the way you're saying it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was super exciting. And then um, we, we end up um, uh, hanging around with the uh, with the guys I told you about and the friends and stuff. And we became just just awesome, um, you know, friends through that. And I got more uh, as I was raising a little bit of money. I got I got more, I guess, self direction in life to say that either you know shit or get off the pot. Either try for you know to get into back into aviation or not. And and it, as you know getting into flying, whether it's a private pilot's license or an instrument rating or commercial takes a lot of money. And, um, I knew I wasn't, you know, independently wealthy by that time at all, for sure. You know, I was making minimum wage in three different jobs. So, um, but I went to the airport and I just started hanging around. Um, you know, I was kind of like the, the parasite at the airport that was just, you know, running into people and, and one cool thing about the aviation community, and you probably know this is that they're just the coolest people, um, you know, if I do say so myself, but they're just super awesome people that'll uh, take you under their wing. Um, and they're excited about aviation and they all have a passion for aviation and they love other people that have a passion for aviation. And you just kind of, you know, you share experiences. So i had met this guy uh, named uh, Josh uh, Jackson, whose dad had a flight school and um, as well as repaired aircraft at the local airport. And I helped him out in the hangar, you know, a little bit. I was probably more of a hindrance than a help, but helped him wash airplanes, help him turn wrenches, do, do whatever I could. And we became friends. And his dad said, well, I'll give you, um, I'll let you use the airplane under like a credit system for work. So you can work, I'll give you, you know, and then you can get instruction, but you have to pay for the instruction, you know, and stuff. And so we did that. And now it's able to get through a private pilot's license. And dude, I was, couldn't have been more happy about that opportunity. Um, and I owed him a lot. And I, I 
you know, paid them off. And, uh, it was just, it was a really good deal for me, uh, to get through it. And, um, so coincidentally had been, uh, enrolled at a community college because they were the only people that would take me. Um, so I did an online business degree because the, having the three jobs and stuff like that was like, you know, impossible to go to physically go to classes. Um, so did the online deal, like usually in the wee hours in the morning and, um, and then tried to fly, you know, at some point in time and, and, and did that. And then ended up, uh, actually getting through an instrument rating and then getting through a commercial rating, uh, and then met a lot of cool people, uh, at the airport. And I still kept my bartending job at night. And I had, um, had met a dude that he was a regular at the bar and he was an old Navy fighter pilot and he was a Hornet pilot. And he had a, uh, um, this Chinese CJ six Nanchang, which is like a Chinese primary trainer that he had imported and had a radial engine. He asked me if I want to go fly with them, you know, of course. And so we had a great time. And then he said, well, you know, uh, I could put you on the insurance if you want, and you can take it to, you know, air shows and stuff and whatever. I was like, this is like insane. And absolutely. So, you know, did that a little bit. And then I got a couple other aviation jobs where I had flown, uh, skydivers, you know, for a bit, um, and in a bunch of different locations and lived in a trailer during a couple seasons up in New York and then in Maryland and then some other places. And, um, uh, that was, you know, super interesting flying, building hours, but you're making $30 a day or less, you know, for flying jumpers. So I did that. And then I ran into a group of people at the airport that I was from that had a junkyard. So they had this huge junkyard of airplanes that they had uh, taken like insurance wrecks and stuff. And they had to try to assemble like one good airplane out of like five wrecked airplanes. You know what I mean? So the guy approached me and he said, Hey, would you want to fly this Cessna? that we just assembled from eight Cessnas that had tornado damage down to Puerto Rico. I said, absolutely. There's no question. I'll do it. He's like, I'll even throw in a life raft. And I said, done. He's like, and I'll pay you 1500 bucks. I said, apps. That's fine. That's great. <laughs> uh, I said, when do I start? You know? So I planned it out and it was going from the East coast of Florida to uh, down to Puerto Rico, which, which is kind of far for a single engine airplane. So, um, you know, I test fly the airplane once and I, test flew for like 20 minutes and decided it was totally fine for me to take in my expert knowledge of uh, all things aviation. And so I had taken off from uh, Florida, went to the Bahamas to uh, North Eleuthera, got some gas there. And I had to time it because the airplane had almost no instruments. It was like super VFR only airplane. And uh, there was no nighttime VFR in the islands. Um, so you had to make it during the daytime. And since you're going east, right, uh, you're kind of up against daylight as far as getting there. So I go from North Eleuthera, you know, uh, go through customs there, refuel. I go to Providenciales in the Turks and Caicos, and we get delayed for customs. And nighttime's kind of approaching. I'm like, God, you know, screw it. I'll take off anyways, you know, whatever. If I break a few rules, who cares? Uh, and then it's about 500 miles from uh, Providenciales to Puerto Rico, which is like the max range of a 172 uh, plus about, you know, I don't know. Basically, I had about a, a hundred miles of slop um, of reserve in there, and I got about halfway there, and I noticed that one of the wings wasn't feeding, and uh, it was a bad time to notice it because you're over water and it's starting to get nighttime, and uh, you've probably flown over the water at night, like in the middle of the ocean, and th there's not really that much out there, uh, and uh, if you're going to ditch at night, well, you know it's probably not going to go great, <laughs> and what's more is like the nearest coast guard station is you know hours and hours away. And, you know, it's just, it's just not where you want to be, you know? Brian, how many hours do you have at this point in time? Like 250. Cause I had just Holy gotten, crap. Crap. yeah. So, and, and I wouldn't even call those like quality hours either. I would call those like, you know, so, so hours. So, uh, end up, oh my God, man, this sucks. So uh, I got to climb up and I'm climbing up to the point where you get, um, almost hypoxic, right? Cause it's either that or, you know, try to save some gas here and, and, uh, take advantage of the wings, winds aloft. So I, I get out and I'm VFR only, only have a VOR, uh, to navigate. So no GPS. So no, like I had to do old school navigation with dead reckoning, like over the ocean and stuff and had a, uh, sectional chart for down there. And I found the Dominican Republic, the closest airport that I could see was Punta Cana, uh, which is on kind of the tip of the Dominican Republic. 
So I tuned in their VOR. I got a, uh, I got a bearing to it. I had done some calculations with like winds and stuff as I was flying over the Bahama islands. And basically it was like uh, doing like time cuts with a stopwatch of when you're arriving to get a ground speed hack. So I got kind of an idea roughly about when, you know, where I needed to be and if I could make it there. And it was only about, I, I made it there and I was about five-ish miles out, had the uh, runway in sight and stuff. And then the engine gave up. Uh, and so uh, we ended up, I ended up uh, gliding into Punakana, which uh, was interesting because um, back when I had my problem, I had tried to get in touch with um, San Domingo Approach and didn't get anything. Uh, so I had relayed to a Ryanair flight that was, or not a Ryanair, but a, a JetBlue flight that was above me and said, uh, hey, I got an emergency. I'm, I'm going to Dominican. I'll see you guys, you know, whatever. And then I was really concerned because the U.S. Customs is very, very, very strict about flights that uh, they have this thing called an EAPIS and U.S. Customs wants to know exactly what your destination and your, um, uh, you know, where you've come from is. And um, I had diverted from that into another country. Um, so that was, you know, problematic for me. So anyways, uh, I dead stick it in, have enough energy to get off the taxiway. Um, so I get on the taxiway and I'm luckily coast to where the gas, uh, like the fuel farm was the guy comes out. I don't speak any Spanish at that point. He's just only speaking Spanish. We figure out that we need, I need gas. I said, well, I have, I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, I have one good tank. So I think I can make it from here on that one good tank. If I fill it up to Puerto Rico, but the only problem is it's a VFR only airplane. Uh, and I have to file IFR because it's nighttime now. Like, real, well, real quick, Ryan, just, yeah, sure. I, I love the detail just for people who are listening to VFR and IFR basically saying you can only fly what you can see. If you go into the clouds, like you, you're not supposed to be flying in the clouds with this is what you're saying. Right. And you're yeah. not even supposed to be flying out of the clouds at night, which you're right. doing, right? Just a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll get right back to this combat story. As you know, I live in California, where we can have earthquakes and fires, and I grew up in Florida with hurricanes. I know firsthand how natural disasters can quickly and unexpectedly put me and my family in a position where we have to hunker down, shelter in place, and sometimes without power, so I always want to have food available. You can create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years super survival food. Handpicked right in a family owned facility in the U.S., giving jobs to over 200 Americans, which we love. The kits are compact, sturdy, water resistant, and stack easily. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, you can go to fourpatriots.com and use the code COMBAT to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including their three-month survival kit. You'll get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97. They're called Four Patriots because a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Just go to fourpatriots.com and use combat to get 10% off. That's the number four, patriots.com. Use the code combat and start building your own stockpile today. And now back to this combat story. So basically yeah. you're in a point where it's nighttime. You might have to go IFR from another country that's not on your flight plan. Yeah. And this was in like, you know, I am full of bad decision-making like that is, you know, I'm the worst and this was no exception. Uh, so, you know, I fill up, you know, with gas and I, uh, I, I am able to file a flight plan and which was miraculous at the time of finding who I needed to file this flight plan from. Cause I ended up going up to their tower and stuff. And I don't know, we did hand signals and papers and stuff, and we ended up making it work out. So I, I took off I landed at Aguadilla, um, Puerto Rico, which is kind of on the uh, Western tip there. And, um, uh, ATC, I said, Hey, you know, this is me, Cessna, whoever, um, I had a emergency, uh, I'm here now. Uh, I need, you know, taxi the ramp, whatever. And they're like, okay, well here, here's where you need to taxi. You need a taxi over here and you need to stop in front of this specific ramp. So like, oh, okay, no problem. You know, I'm new here. That sounds great. Uh, and then uh, U.S. Customs came out and they held me at gunpoint um, and they searched, you know, searched everything. Anyways, uh, so no drugs were on the airplane, obviously, you know, no problem at all. Uh, I told them the story and they were they were actually really cool about it. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, no problem. I was like, you know, hey, listen, like, you know, 
I, maybe they knew that I was just real dumb uh, and they just had, you know, pity on me. Uh, but they're like, okay, yeah, yeah no, no problem. So, so the guy that I dropped off the airplane to um, was super appreciative. And he said, um, hey, we're interested in uh, trying to acquire more airplanes from the US. Would you uh, let me hire you? And you can go to the US and you can just, we'll give you money you buy it and then your friend who's a mechanic uh if he can do the annual which is you know a required inspection and get them all flying uh then we you can just fly it down here for us and i said absolutely like that is great they never asked about insurance requirements they never asked about experience they didn't know they were dealing with like the least experienced person out there who was just nodding his head yep, yep yeah man yeah i'll absolutely do that so they had me uh go get all kinds of different airplanes, like, uh, you know, Cessna 421s, which is a twin to King Air to uh, Beach Barons to, you know, and they were fairly complex airplanes for me. And I decided that it was such a good opportunity that I wasn't going to really tell many people about it. And I was just going to, you, you were going to read the pilot's operating handbook on the airline flight out to go get the airplane and jump in and go. And, uh, and then we figured out, you know, figured out later on that a lot of airplanes fly the same. You just got a rabbit turtle, you know, and you're pretty much, you're, you're good to go in that point. And we all kind of fly similarly. And, you know, if you study the fuel system, usually that's a critical, you know, thing to study. And, you know, anyways, it all kind of worked out. Um, and I had a few emergencies with those airplanes, you know, lost a motor here or there. Uh, and, uh, and they ended up, it ended up working out. However, the, um, during the midst of this, this would happen like maybe once every two months or something like that. So it, it wasn't a, a high paying job, but I was flying jumpers on the side. And then our Navy buddy who, uh, who had that, um, Chinese aircraft and had me take it to air shows. Uh, I had done, done that once up at Oceana and I had met a dude up there at the Oak club, uh, named, uh, Jared Isaacman, who was a he, he was my age and he's super successful businessman he had started a credit card processing company in his parents basement you know and all this stuff and be, he ended up becoming a billionaire uh bottom line and we became great friends and uh he hired me on with his company you know and stuff but anyways right uh before that i had taken a uh beach baron um down to uh puerto rico uh, and I had dropped it off to the guy that, uh, that had hired me initially, his name was Santos and Santos was a very jolly guy. You know, I liked him, you know, for the most part. And I was the most naive person in the entire world ever, uh, at that point, because all the places that I dropped off some of the aircraft, um, was, it was, it it was sketchy. I would say like in hindsight, I would never have done that, but in, in, you know, my young uh, younger days, it was just a big adventure. And I mean, really sketchy stuff. And, How old uh, were you at the time when you were doing this, Ryan? I was 22, 23, maybe, you know, this is and, great. Uh, yeah. And I had, I remember one, I remember a few things like, you know, how you have like little red flags that go off in your head, but then you completely dismiss them and you're like, nah, nah that's fine. And I remember one time of dropping an airplane off and a guy picked me up at the airport. Cause this guy said, Hey, there's, there's going to be a guy who picks you up at the airport in a Lexus. I said, okay, this was at an, another airport down, down South, way down South. And he said, um, uh, so he got, I got into his Lexus SUV and I had jumped in the back. He was super nice. Uh, he didn't speak any English at all. Uh, but you know, it, it was, I was, I was naive and nice and everything. And I had jumped in the back and there was a bunch of submachine guns in the back and, uh, and they were, I, you know, I was familiar with guns and stuff like that. These were really off brand, like South American stuff that I had never seen, or I didn't even know what they were anymore. And I was pretty good with like gun viz recce, you know, anyways, he, he picks me up and he stop in the middle of this neighborhood or whatever. And he's like, he basically tells me to wait, uh, in the car. And I was like, okay. And he's gone for like four hours. And then, uh, it, I ended up like wandering into a corner store to get a beer. <laughs> and uh, I meet this guy who's also in the corner store. And this is like two in the morning. Who's from Haiti and who's had to evacuate based on his, uh, um, he, he was involved in like the earthquake stuff over there. And he speaks English. So we're starting to talk in English and stuff. He was a great, you know, I had a great time with him. We drank some Presidente beer and stuff. And, uh, and then 
the guy comes back randomly and then we go, we drive to a hotel and, and then, you know, that was that. And then he drops me off at the airport in the morning and I take, you know, flew the airplane uh, back to Puerto Rico and stuff. And anyways, yeah, so that, that was one of the sketchy, you know, sketchy things are just, just really random weird stuff. But so the last flight that I did, um, I dropped off this Baron and, um, uh, Santos said, Hey, would you want to come with me to San Domingo, uh, in the Baron? And I said, no, I got to jump on this jet blue flight back to Florida, uh, because I'm trying to, you know, I had another job that I was going to do. So I go, okay, no problem. So, um, I leave him there and then I, I, um, land in Florida in Orlando on kind of a red eye flight and his secretary calls me and said, Hey, did you hear what happened to Santos? So, nope. Uh, I said, well, Google his name. I said, okay. And it turns out that he flew to Dominican Republic. And while he was trying to leave, um, somebody shot him twice in the back of the head, dumped him in a ditch, and then found 52 kilos of cocaine on that Baron, and um, which is a twin, a light twin. And the uh, Dominicans had seized the uh, airplane. And it turns out um, that it was potentially he got set up and stuff or whatever. But uh, I didn't really know much, many of the details. So I decided that I probably wouldn't be working there anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I decided <laughs> that it was best to just say, okay, that was great. You know, I'll stay in the US for this one. So anyways, so I started working for, for Jared and, and, and Jared had, um, Jared Isaacman had, um, he, he was really into aviation as well. And he, he, wanted to start a jet team, an air show jet team. And so he bought a bunch of L L 39s. And so I said, Hey, you know, listen, I have some, some super sketchy twin time, you know, uh, but I'm happy to fly like whatever, whenever. And so he hired me on for the air show season. And, and I just helped like wash airplanes and polish airplanes. And occasionally I caught a ride and stuff. And I did a bunch of like logistics stuff and they had a business jet and ended up, uh, starting to fly that. And, uh, I, uh, I had the best time of my life, uh, with those guys. And so the jet team had these guys who were air force fighter pilots. They had been on the Thunderbirds before. And, uh, you know, a, a couple other guys had some other backgrounds that, that Jared what's the name hired. of the jet team. So back in the day, it was called the heavy metal jet team who became the black diamond jet team. Um, who's, uh, they're technically still around, but cool. Uh, yeah. In any case, uh, so we, we go around the air shows, you know, and having a great time and stuff. And I'm, and we're with these pilots who were just incredible and they had these crazy stories um you know, a couple of f-16 guys and uh you know they'd been previous thunderbirds and we had one f-15 guy and then we had one guy uh named snort uh snodgrass who is a uh uh legend in the f-14 community um so just great people overall and i was just humbled to be in their presence and just around you know what i mean when you're around in a bar and you're not talking you're just listening to stories and stuff and it's just like the greatest time of your life um, so, uh, anyway, so hung around with those guys and, and got a lot of time flying, uh, jets and stuff, and then ended up getting type rated in this, uh, old Sylvia L39, which is their jet trainer. Uh, and then, uh, so I'm like, well, you know what, I'm going to still go try to be a fighter pilot. So I got, um, hired by the, uh, strangely enough, I got hired by a guard unit in Tulsa, um, a Oklahoma guard uh, to fly F-16s, which is like the greatest, if you get hired by a guard unit, that's, you know, the holy grail of, of stuff. And we had, uh, so it, they had an interview process, you know, you go to and stuff. And, I, and it was like, I don't know, they had like 20 people there and they were going to hire like one person. They decided to hire two people. And uh, the other guy that they hired, I remember meeting him there. I asked him what he did, you know, cause everybody's like a dog sniffing each other's butts and stuff as they're, you know, as they're walking into the interview. And, uh, I asked him what he, what he does. And he says, uh, I'm a test pilot. And I said, what? He's like, I'm a test pilot for Hawker beach, you know, and, and in the T6 anyway. So he's a test pilot for Hawker beach in the T6. So of course he's going to get hired. That's, you know, this crazy, you know, he's got 3,500 hours and stuff and this and that. And I was like, well, you know, I flew for these sketchy people and, you know, <laughs> And you know, here, here's my resume, you know, I uh, flunked out of school and I got a community college, you know, and, and they're like, Hmm, that's interesting. Like you're hired. So, um, so I was like, well, that's, uh, that's great. So they make you enlist in the unit, uh, prior to actually getting hired. It's more like a formality thing. Um, but I go to what's called AMS or Academy of Military Science. So I orders cut everything from there. And so AMS, 
um, which is the guards equivalent of OTS. Uh, so it's just like a quick commissioning, you know, uh, school program at Maxwell, uh, Alabama. So they have a um, PT test that they do as an initial assessment there. And um, I had been in pretty good shape because I'd been ocean lifeguard and stuff. So I was like, I was in decent shape. So I start uh, in the PT test and it, it is day one, like day, day zero, really. I'm doing my sit-ups, you know, I'm cranking them out. And the guy who's counting is like not counting all of them. And I was like, man, that is really rude, you know, and doesn't say a word. He just doesn't count them. <laughs> and he gets to like, you know, you had to do like, I don't know, 50 or something, you know, in a minute. And, uh, and he counts like 40. And I was like, wait, like, I just did a shit ton of these. Like, and he's like, yeah, they weren't acceptable eh, or whatever like that. And I was like, okay, whatever, you know, and mo moving on. And then, so, we, you know, go to another in, uh, orientation class that tells you, you know, whatever. And then that night, you know, they come in and call my name along with like maybe 40, 40 other people or so. And they said, you all failed your in entrance PT test. You're out, you're gone, you're done. And then that was it. So I called the unit and I was like, Hey, listen, um, I just failed this PT test and I, I'm not really hundred percent sure why it's supposed to be the air force. It's supposed to be easy. Like I did all these sit-ups and stuff and you know, I, I don't understand, you know, I, I maxed out the push-ups, but the sit-ups are, you know, what? and, um, they're like, okay, uh, well, you know, sorry or whatever. They're like, well, uh, we're really sorry, but you know, that was your chance or whatever. So this was about 2000, 2009 ish timeframe. And so, um, I'm like, well, hmm, this is, you know, unfortunate. So I decided, well, I'm just going to go to an OTS recruiter and see if I can't get through OTS. So the guy is going through my record and he's like, wait a minute, you flunked out of an air force ROTC scholarship. You just failed a PT test. You have a, you had a almost no GPA and you're wanting to come in the air force. Like, yeah, yep. That's me. So, um, he said, okay, well, you know, I'll put your, I'll put the package in, but they're probably not going to pick you up. Um, but well, you know, I'll do the work if you really want them to. So, okay. So you, I, you know, list the options. I put pilot first, uh, Wizzo second, you know, and stuff. And, and so the air force comes back and for some reason, some weird reason, I don't know why it was a paperwork anomaly, some clerk, like, messed up but they said uh we'll give you a wizard slot for ots i said absolutely so now i know like man these people are nazis about sit-ups at you know ots so i'm gonna work like extra hard to do like super i'm gonna slow. kill it yeah super slow form you know whatever go there turns out ots pt test was cake and it was nothing like the ams pt test where they don't count you know most all of your sit-ups or whatever so get through OTS and then, um, end up, uh, going to Pensacola for flight school for the, uh, to, to be what's called a CISO, uh, and then go to, uh, the B course for the F. So I get selected for F 15 E go become a, uh, um, a wizard in the F 15 E at the B course, and then go for my first assignment at Lake and Heath, um, do a full four year oh, tour there. And oh, then, oh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So you didn't have to compete for like a, a fighter pilot, not not a fighter pilot, but like jets. Like you, I did, you, yeah. mm -hmm. you did. So, mm -hmm. but you said you kind of put in like your rank order was like fighter pilot. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so pilot, uh, and then technically the Air Force is calling it CISO. Um, so a CISO slot, which basically is like a nav slot. Um, so you go to nav school, or they call it CISO okay. school. Um, and then you compete. You just like everybody else, you compete, and they usually have uh, you know. Out of a class of like 25, they might have like two or three F-15s out of that. Uh, and then the rest to go to either B-1s or B-52s or AC-130s or, um, you know, any of the big, big wow. fatties. So so you went the CISO slot, that you got that slot, and mm -hmm. then you had to compete within that to get into the JET community. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you just talked about all these problems you had. What what changed that puts you at the top of that list? Well, I, I like to think I'm really good at, at bullshitting and, uh, you know, so, uh, I tried to, 
I tried to work really hard uh, in school and, and I had kind of a natural um, aviation leg up, I guess, from flying from so yeah. much. So a lot of it was really pretty basic skills on um, the aviation side of instruments and knowing, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so, um, so I tried, you know, tried really hard and know that I, I knew that I wanted to go fighters. There was no other question. Uh, although I, I really enjoy the mission that um, some of the AFSOC uh, guys, so like the AC-130 gunships and stuff. And, um, you know, I, I really love what they do. And, and, and I have a lot of great friends in that community. Um, it was just, I kind of identified more on the fighter track as it were. So competed for that, got it. Um, and, and I was a little concerned that I wasn't going to get it, but ended up getting it. And you, you compete. Uh, in that school, you go through T6s is your first, which is a single engine turboprop. Uh, and then you go into uh, this sim phase, which is kind of bullshit. But you, anyways, you do like sim stuff. And then you go into T1s, which is a, uh, um, essentially a um, it's a beach jet. It's a, um, a, corp, a business jet, um, but they have some like fake radar stuff in the back that you can do uh, and prove your worth. And then you get grades in that. And then you go to, uh, you know, you get selected. It, they changed the course a little bit since I've been there, but that was it. Uh, so that, that, that gets you into the, um, backseat of the strike Eagle. Um, and then you compete for your assignment of where you want to go in the B course, which is nine months long, where you learn the basics of the F-15E. And then the idea was that, well, if I get some street cred in the strike Eagle community, then I can apply for pilot training. So I'll go from the back seat to the front seat. And so I did that. Um, and then it took me like three attempts, three boards to try to, you know, get uh, into the front seat. So did that uh, and then ended up, you know, uh, going to uh, to your own NATO Joint Ship Pilot Training uh, in Shepard, Texas. So, Okay. So oh, yeah. you, <laughs> you have to have the most circuitous route, the most anomalous route, to get into that seat, I have to imagine. It's the worst, yeah. You, you, no, so you're super humble. So I don't know if I, I can even get this question across, but how much of an advantage was that crazy circuitous route when it came time to get in the aircraft to compete? Um, you know, I I think it had it, I think it had advantages and disadvantages. Um in and I say that because it, the advantage was that you're um, you're familiar with a, with a lot of stuff, like you know what I mean. You're familiar with the systems, but you're also fed up with bullshit. So you don't have to, you you have less of a threshold for like stroking people's ego uh, and instructors and stuff. And then that's when you start, you know, especially when you go back to pilot training and stuff, and then you come back to the community and then you start over again and stuff like that. You're like. Ah. You know, because at that time you're, you're it's such a long road there. You just don't have time for uh, some other people. So it can come across as like this guy isn't very, you know, he he's not he's not a, a young blossom that we're you know <laughs> we're we're trying to pollinate here. Um, he's just kind of you know salty about everything you know and life and stuff. But so, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if that um... answers. <laughs> no, it does. It does. I mean, I have to imagine that it, it, ha I, I would think it would be a very big advantage if you're going up against what I assume is more of the traditional route of like, all right, it did, maybe they did civil air patrol in high school. They got some flying hours. They went to the academy. They go to the, they go to flight school. They're competing. Like they've done this pretty specific route, which is designed to get you into that position. But man, you just had to hustle for years, like yeah. really have to hustle in a way. And I was in that other group. I was in that tr more traditional group of like, people have been showing me the way you figured it out on your, I, I don't know, maybe it's the agency side of me talking here where I'm like, wow, you had to hustle like that. The agency would eat that up, man. I love it. Well, it, it's also like uh, not super smart. And one thing I appreciated was that the guys who either came from the Academy or around, like they were good at time management they were good at like, they would take, they could take something that somebody said and they could actually do something with it. Whereas I needed to learn my mistakes over and over and over again, you know? Uh, and I needed to, I was naive about, you know, a lot of stuff and ended up. So it was, it was definitely the, the school of hard knocks, you know? Um, but, uh, but, you know, eh, you know, 
whatever life's a journey. No, I know. How about this? So we, we rarely interview somebody who's still in, mm -hmm. um, most of the guys, because they're out, they're older, like me, they're old men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How old were you on nine 11? And what was that event like for you? I haven't heard that come up yet. Oh yeah. So, um, I was a junior in high school, uh, during that time. So whatever that is, what is that? 16 ish somewhere. Yep. Um, and, and I remember, you know, I remember where I was, I was actually at a gym and I remember watching it while I was on the treadmill. Um, and I was, I had no idea what had just happened. Um, I thought it was an accident. You know, I thought it was the first one was an accident and then it happened again. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, something's up here. Um, so it was never really, uh, September 11th was never really like the, the super moment that I decided that I wanted to go into the military like it is for a lot of people. Um, I do remember that same year sounds, uh, you know, is that Black Hawk Down came out as well. And Black Hawk, Black Hawk Down had a huge impact on me for whatever reason. And it was about this, this brotherhood and it was about this, you know, service and you know you're you're doing things and you're having these experiences and you're you're doing them for a purpose and in this and that and um so I, I thought that was very impactful uh and then the September 11th thing was just like for me at least and I think it was maybe because I was 16 is that just the rest of the rest of my life and the rest of my you know service would be like in in the shadow of uh the GWAT you know so it's just like a matter of fact uh, sort of thing. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, Black Hawk Down had a very similar appeal to me. Um, but maybe it's just age, like when 9 11 happened, I was like, Oh, my God, how do I get into this thing super fast? Um, that that's so interesting. Okay, sure. so let's talk you're you're in the F 15. We've not mm -hmm. been able to discuss the F 15 yet. Can you give people a primer? What sure. does this thing do? Yeah, we we talked about the the pilot. We got the Wizzo. Um, what's what uh, if you had to do a quick walk around? Talk us through the F fifteen. Yeah, so it's a um, you know two seat multi role fighter. Uh, so it can do air to ground and air to air uh, as well. Um, we have a variety of different mission sets uh, that come from what's called a doc statement. But um, speaking in like more generalities and stuff, uh, generally the, uh, there's two big missions. Uh, one of them is called defensive counter air, which means that we can, um, uh, you fly around and then you target, um, like attacking aircraft, aircraft that are going to bomb something that's important to you. Um, and then offensive counter air is where you go kind of do a fighter sweep, uh, into somewhere. And then you start shooting down enemy aircraft. Those are the two big air to air missions that we do. Uh, and then we do air interdiction, which is like uh, cutting off supply lines and cutting off uh, things that are flowing into the um, like a front lines of a, uh, a battle. So a flot. Uh, and we do close air support, um, which is, uh, you know, responding to uh, to very close in combat. Uh, and um, and then we do, you know, a variety of other things here and there, um, like standoff weapon targeting and, um, you know, some other stuff. So, uh, so th that's pretty much it. Like the, the strike eagle can do a bunch. We, we carry a variety of, uh, either GPS slash INS guided weapons, uh, laser guided weapons. Um, some of them are long range weapons like the JASM. Um, uh, and, um, we carry the, uh, AMRAM, which is the AIM-120, which is a, um, a radar guided, uh, missile. And then we carry a, a heat seeking missile called the AIM-9. Uh, and we carry almost every weapon you can think of, uh, small diameter bombs, um, everything. So everything is targetable inside the aircraft and we can target that in a couple of different ways. We can either, uh, target them with like what we call absolute targeting or, or bomb on coordinate where we can put a coordinate into the weapon and it can, it can fly to that coordinate, or we can just find stuff on the ground and we can designate on stuff. And then we can tell the bomb that's exactly where I want you to go, uh, and then hit it that way. So. It doesn't, does it have any, uh, like smaller arms besides missiles and bombs, any ammo? Yeah, we have rounds? a, we have an M61 A1, uh, so 20 millimeter, um, and, uh, which is, it's, 
it, it's made for air to air. It has a two degree up cant to the gun. So um, it's made for uh, basically, so if you're fighting another aircraft, uh, you're going to want to pull a lot of lead uh, on that to shoot um, based on the bullet time of flight and bullet sag and everything else. So it has a natural two degree up cant that they designed into it to give you a little bit better edge. Uh, when we strafe air to ground, uh, that's actually a disadvantage um, because it requires you to have a steeper flight path angle. Um, which can cause you to get really fast. So generally on like air to ground strafes and stuff, we can get to, you can almost get to uh, like 500 knots. So normally our limits like about 480 knots, but you can get to about 500 knots pointing out the ground, at, you know, 25 degrees down. Um, and then we'll have uh, some of the strafe requires a uh, either a 500 foot or a 300 foot recovery. So um, there's a lot of ground rush and stuff that you kind of get used to, but it, it, everything happens very, very fast uh, in that jet. Uh, especially when it comes to the ground stuff. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, talk, talk to us about when you get to your first unit, you're the new guy, the new officer rolling in. We've, we've heard it from SEALs and Delta operators and Green Berets. What's it like being the new guy rolling into a unit just fresh out of flight school? Yeah. So, you know, it's been this way for a hundred years probably, but everybody assumes that you're completely stupid and you don't know anything um which is good because you can learn a lot that way and um you try to soak up everything that you can and everything's new to you and you don't know what you don't know and all the, these people in the squadron seem like you know legends and you're hearing them talk about combat stories and there i was and you know at the bar and one thing about your your fighter culture and your fighter squadrons is that every fighter squadron has to have a bar in the squadron that's like a rule somewhere i'm not really sure where it's at but it's it's somewhere and so uh i go to lake and heath england for my first um assignment which is awesome because there's so much history with the raf and the battle of britain and you know everything else and there's a bar in downtown cambridge called the eagle uh that has um that used to be a uh, an old uh, raf and army air corps pub where flyers would burn their names into the ceiling before they before they would go out on a mission, and so they still have their names in the ceiling. Super cool, you know. And that, so we, that is awesome. That's yeah, you awesome. have to go. You have to go to the Eagle at some point. Um, and uh, you know, there's all these pictures and stuff. And so we'll we'll get squadron gatherings there, and everybody will get you know trashed and start singing old fighter pilot songs and stuff. And then the English people think that we're all crazy and stuff. Sometimes we get the RAF there too, and they're a little bit more toned down, but they're, they're awesome as well. Um, anyway, so as you're doing these training missions in England, you're flying in the same skies that, you know, the battle of Britain was happening yet, you know, and you just like this crazy history and you're looking down and you're seeing all these old, uh, fields that you knew were either decoy fields or they were spitfire fields or, you know, whatnot, uh, or where B-17s were. And it's just the coolest thing. Right. Um, so the, the uh squadron bar is like a pub that we, we we had built um so you know you have all your squadron like collectibles you know in there from combat or whatnot you know and um so we go there and, and the squadron bar is fundamental because it's the best place to learn in the entire squadron because that's where you hear you hear in a very informal way what happened, what people did, what people didn't do, uh, how it worked out. And you can ask questions and everything. And it's just, it's just a great place to be. Um, and, uh, so part of being that was being enamored with this whole culture and saying that this is so cool. And we're, we're sort of, we're in, uh, Europe, you know, we're in England and we also have a mission where you know we would do we, we we would work some of the um you know strikes in africa and stuff from the base and which was awesome you know so every once in a while you'd get an intel brief in the master bedroom in the vault uh as we called it and um they would just tell you hey this just went down you guys are on alert going to crew rest this and that and you felt like you were really you know part of this alert team that was ready to go, you know, and you couldn't tell your family about what had just happened, but you start packing your 72 hour bag and it was just really exciting. Um, but when you first get to the squadron, you go through something called MQ, which is mission qualification training. Uh, and it's a series of, of different rides and different mission sets where they, they teach you how the operational squadron operates. Um, 
and um you get graded on those rides and uh you know i hooked a bunch of rides which means you you failed the ride um and uh you'll see it again you know and stuff and then they all make fun of you in the bar and everything and this happens to every class that goes through and um it, it's it's a it's a great time it's great like brotherhood you know to be in and um is that like a, a gauntlet that they just want you to have to go through ryan yeah I, mostly i mean it's a formal part of the like the the squadron syllabus and stuff but each squadron has their own flavor to it some are some haze more than others do some don't but uh, at the end of the day, our squadron had been um, involved in so many contingency operations and so much combat. And when I got there, um, they had just come back from their first, uh, they were like Syria night one, you know, with the ISIS stuff. They had just gotten back. So everybody, you know, super salty. And, you know, they look at you like, you know, what do you know, kid? You haven't been there. You haven't seen what I've seen, you know, and all this stuff. And I didn't realize that you know, two years later, I would be the same guy who was coming back and looking at the new people, like, you don't know what I've seen, you know? Um, so the, uh, um, I looked up to those guys and, 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 and they were awesome. Uh, and, uh, so every, every, uh, fire squadron and throughout the Air Force, we have these things called patches, these, these, uh, these people. So these, uh, these people called patches that are weapon school grads, um, and they're like the, uh, kind of the center point of the squadron as far as tactics goes and everybody kind of goes and they ask them questions and stuff. They, so they get a patch from, uh, six months at the air force weapon school, they come back, uh, and then they, uh, they run the weapon shop in the squadron, which is the weapons and tactics shop, which drives a lot of the way that the squadron employs super smart, very dependable people. Uh, and I remember our patch uh, named Paco Benitez, which we uh, we did a couple uh, merge podcasts with and stuff. And he, he's a great guy. But I remember distinctly the first time I met him, uh, you know, I go back in the vault and try to ask him some dumb question, which, you know, it was some stupid question, I remember. And uh, he just turns back around and looks at me and he's like, can't you just look that up yourself? You know, and then <laughs> goes back to like typing on Zipper or something, you know, whatever it was. And, uh, and, and that was kind of the, the flavor of the squadron was like, you need to find answers yourself, stop being lazy, you know, and, and once you study for a change and stuff, and that would pay off a lot, you know, more later. And, and they were big on critical thinking and uh, the way the squadron, you know, function would be awesome when we, uh, would later on, you know, deploy and stuff. So I gotta say, um, th so I just re-interviewed Kim Campbell, um, killer chick or KC mm -hmm. was her yeah. call sign, right? A 10 pilot. Mm -hmm. She mentioned a uh, very similar to what you're talking about, this culture of the bar. Like, and I was asking her like, what do you miss? She's like, I miss the bar on Friday night. Like that's where we would go. And that's where you'd learn a lot of the stuff. You could just ask whatever you wanted. You'd hear these stories of people who were in, in that crap. And you'd use that information later. And I don't know I didn't really experience that in the army. I don't know if the army has a culture of it. The agency is incredible at that, like sharing that oral history. They just are, are very good at it. But it sounds like the Air Force has it, right? Like this, maybe it's in a bar, but you're learning. Yeah, so we do these things called roll calls. And I don't know if she, she probably talked a little bit about those, but mm -mm. Uh, so roll calls back go back to World War I where you would come back from a sortie like either at the end of the week and you would call the role of everybody in the squadron. And in World War I, not everybody would show up on the role because, you know, some people would die. Uh, so you would kind of honor them by drinking and telling stories about them when they weren't there. Um, and so the roll call uh, began to be a thing where you would do it, you know, maybe once every two months or something. So everybody would get in and you would have, you had a mayor that, you know, he directs the whole thing and he's some captain in the squadron. That's just, you know, sort of funny. And um, you're all drinking and stuff and you, you name people, you know, sometimes that, or you, you have, you have all these like the rules, you know, that go with it and you can call people out no, no matter if they're an 06 or an 07, if they show up to the roll call, they're all fair game. And, this thing called instant justice where you can just you know throw spear now you got to be ready to get spears you know back but uh but anyways you can you know we have a couple games you know that play and everything and uh and, and it's this great time where everybody appreciates everybody else you're able to speak uh speak your mind and you know mob rule and all this sort of stuff uh but uh um the the cool thing is that as everybody's in this like kind of vulnerable point where 
Um, you know, they're, they're cutting loose, either they're, you know, drinking, some people drink, some people don't, you know, whatever, but they're cutting loose and they're in kind of a vulnerable place and everybody trusts each other really at that point. And it builds up a lot of camaraderie and a lot of trust through that. And when you're telling stories, you can make fun of people as you're telling stories, you know, as long as it's funny. Right. And, uh, and anyways, it's just a great, great way for the squadron to bond and the squadron bonds over these roll calls. Uh, you know, and and they get a little crazy with with these songs that you know people will break out into song and sing and throw pizza at other people and break glasses and stuff. And it's just it, it it's kind of a sacred time, but it's also pretty awesome. And the Air Force has kept that all the way from World War One on up through World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, uh, and then generally somewhere in the squadron there's a book of squadron history and then like shenanigans at roll calls and stuff. And every once in a while, you'll get a reading from that about something that happened, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And and uh, and you have pictures in the halls of, you know, previous guys with previous aircraft and stuff. And it's just a it's just a great place to be, you know. I I love that story. I've not heard that that description before. I mean, it sounds could you give an example of what would I can't even imagine throwing some roast joke at an 06 in the army like what, what kind of thing what's a spear that you might throw out there uh well like you know obviously i'll leave names out of it you know for the purposes of you know yeah we'll everything. protect the innocent here yeah exactly but uh sometimes it would be for just like dumb stuff in the jet where you know you have so the cool thing about the air force the air force has a lot of faults uh, i'll be the first one to tell you that but the cool thing about the air force is that um, from the like upper tier officer level from the uh, 06, 07, and e even all the way up to like three star and four star, they will come to roll calls and they will cut loose with everybody else. And that's they're, awesome. That is awesome. They will, uh, but they're all like, a lot of these guys are fighter pilots at heart and they always were. And um, so they, they know when they were a first lieutenant, you know, how it went. And they're, super happy to be able to hang out with people who are passionate about, you know, tactics or passionate about, you know, fighter aviation and everything. And um, so the 06s, 07s, you know, they'll, uh, if you're a wing commander or whatever, you'll, you'll fly with the op squadrons, you know, you may not fly at a like combat mission ready level, but you may fly like three or four times a month. And even in combat, you know, we'll, we had the CFAC at three star, you know, fly, you know, combat lines and stuff. So you're um, it's, it's really cool. And, and they get a taste for ROE and everything and trying to understand it as well as like, they're just, they're out there, you know, doing the job and they're, they're not detached from, you know, what the captains and majors are doing. So when they do dumb stuff in the jet, because they haven't flown as much as everybody else does, then you, you know, you call them out, you know, and like we had an 06 who almost hit, another airplane now granted that's not super funny but it was funny at the roll call uh and um you know almost hits another airplane but you know the the wizard in the back seat actually had to intervene uh at that point but uh and, and that was kind of a long time ago but in any case you know oh. you call them out for stuff like that and, and they'll be the first people to take a spear and be extremely humble about it uh and then they just know that that's just the way it is and everybody will and everybody respects that and then you, you know, you, and that's how the squadron grows of seeing that, you know, your, your wing commander or your group commander or your, you know, whoever, you know, 06, 07, whatever, uh, is not infallible. And he's also willing to say, you know what, I screwed up. Here's how we're going to do it better this time. And everybody says, that's what, that's what we need. And that's what we want. That's awesome. All right. Um, can you take us, obviously it's sensitive, the details are sensitive, so just blur the details, but could you take us through the first time you're like getting into the aircraft, taking off and flying on what you would consider a combat mission? What's it like for you? What role are you in? Are you a Wizzo at the time? Yeah, so a Wizzo initially um, for this one, we uh, we went down to uh, OIR, um, so down in the Syria, Iraq you know, area. You might have to say what OIR is. Oh, so uh, Operation Inherent Resolve, so targeting ISIS uh, for the most part, um, and um, we we get down there and uh, we, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave some stuff out, but uh, but the, the first time that I, I fly combat, um, I I get into the jet, you know, and you're 
it's really funny because in the in the fighter community, you can always tell like somebody's first time deploying by their uh, tan flight suit um, because it's like crisp and starchy, right? And you know the guys who have been on their third deployment because they're wearing their comfortable flight suits, which are sweat stained and you know like nasty, and I'll never give them up. Um, probably have zero fire protection, you know, at that point. But uh, but anyway, so I'm I'm there in my very starchy uniform. I have my combat vest on, you know, my M9 and everything, and you know, jump in the back. And we briefed about what we were going to do. We were going to go out and do defensive counter air because um, we had there, there was some stuff going on with. Um, when we were uh, striking Syria for something and we were, we had a, a, a potential threat, um, uh, air threat um, into uh, Jordan. So we're gonna go fly defensive counter air because the uh, the Raptors that uh, F-22s that were supposed to do DCA had fallen out for maintenance. So we took them over. So it, it's not uncommon for different types of aircraft to take people, other people's uh, spot uh, or role um, in what's called an air tasking order in ATO. So um, we do that. We we fly circles for about an hour or so, and then we get a text message uh, through Link 16 that says there's a troops in contact. Uh, so it's my first, you know, first combat mission. So we get a troops in contact uh, up near Raqqa, um, which is kind of north uh, north Syria uh, ish area. What's going and, through your head right now? Like this is it? Yeah. So the thing that's going through my head is don't screw this up. Like you, you, this is real bombs with real people. You need to be like, you need to be in the game and you need to be fenced in. Like you need to know this stuff. And, um, I was really, really kind of, uh, well, I guess. So prior to this, prior you going on a deployment, you always think, you know, I, I don't really care what, what anybody says, but one thing that you think is what is it going to feel like to kill somebody else? Right. But you honestly think that um, because that's a part of combat and you know that if you're in a kinetic platform, like the your fingers are going to do things that are going to kill people, uh, essentially. And um, so that was running through my mind. What is it going to be like to kill somebody? So we get a troops in contact and we talk to, we get in touch with a JTAC uh, and there's a kind of a cloud deck over Raqqa and it's kind of a lower cloud deck. And we were not going to go uh, under the cloud deck because it would be too low to actually employ any any uh, like GPS guided weapons or anything. Um, but we're going to stay above it. And there was a RPA that was um, said that they could laser in a GBU fifty four, which is a laser guided five hundred pound bomb that we carry. Uh, so essentially, we drop it, and then the RPA um, or MQ nine lasers it in. Where, RPA being a, a drone that's yeah, operating uh, remotely piloted aircraft, right? Yep, a drone. And um, so that we got in comms with the JTAC, they were taking fire, uh, and there was two dishkas, and it was like four enemy packs uh, that they had narrowed down. And we, um, our number one air, I was in the number two aircraft. The number one aircraft was going to drop, and they had a bomb malfunction. So they have what's called a hung secure bomb. Uh, so they tried to press the button, and the bomb didn't come off when the JTAC gave them clearance. So we said that we could, as number two, target that. But all we had uh, at the time was we had one fifty-four that was a normal fifty-four, and then we had one fifty-four that was a low collateral, so it had a carbon fiber case on it. It wasn't ideal for killing packs, uh, basically. Um, but they wanted both of those. So we dropped both of those, uh, and then it ended up taking out the Dishka position, um, and, uh, ended up killing like four, uh, four ISIS dudes on the ground. Um, so that was the first combat drop and it was a little bit impersonal because there was a cloud deck there and somebody else was lazing in the weapon. Um, but, uh, but as far as like your actual button pushes and everything else, we were making sure that, you know, you we knew exactly where the friendlies were. We knew where the enemy was. We knew that the coordinates that we were putting into the weapon were actually going to be on the enemy location, not the friendly location. We knew what the plan was for any type of reattacks and, you know, et cetera, and just battle tracking in general. So I did that, worked out fine, uh, came back. And then the, uh, like the next combat mission was, it was clear in a million out. So I could see what was actually going on. And I remember this very distinctly because we were flying out there and we were coming up to Mosul. And um, I remember looking at Mosul outside and I see it just this huge, uh, just 
a bunch of smoke coming out of the city. And we had switched over to the JTAX radio and the radios were just going off like crazy. We couldn't even check in because he was handing out nine lines to a tens and everything. And everything was just blowing up everywhere. And people were calling in, they were cleared hot, this and that. And we were trying to get our way into the stack. And so you have a altitude deconfliction plan that the JTAC has, right? And we're trying to get our place in there. And finally, the JTAC says, you know, dudes, you're clear, you know, one, seven, one, nine. Um, so we get in there and we get established uh, and then we end up dropping down a block. And I remember as we're flowing over the city, I put my target pod in and looked at where these uh, strikes were going. And I, I'll never forget, I look down this road and there's a dude who jumps out and this is great pod footage. He jumps out of the middle of this, uh, from this building into the middle of the road with an RPG and he shoots the RPG and it hits a bulldozer, which an Iraqi dude was driving down the road to try to clear cars. And it bounces off the blade and hits a building and blows up. And the guy goes running away. It was like, this is like Call of Duty, like straight up, just craziness, just war zone. You know, this guy's running out with, our, and it was just, I couldn't even believe that I was witnessing this live just from a random place where I put my pod in. Uh, and then we ended up dropping a bunch, um, you know, uh, dropping a bunch of weapons on that particular right. sortie uh, as well. So Ryan, uh, so those two cases, right? So it sounds like first one, you got the cloud deck. Second one, um, you, you have at least visual with what you're dropping on. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned kind of the the feeling beforehand. What's this going to be like when I actually have to pull this trigger? Like, yeah. what was it like it, for the first one, the second, either one? How how were you processing it? Yeah, so I was I was really surprised actually um, because I didn't feel a thing, and it didn't even feel like we weren't. It felt like you were executing your mission, you were hitting your target, and you were just satisfied that what you were hitting was what you were supposed to be hitting. Um, and we were looking for effects. We were looking for smoke to clear. We were looking for what we call squirters, which are people coming out of, you know, buildings or whatever, and trying to establish custody on them and trying to figure out tactical movements of the friendly forces, where are they at, uh, where do they have an exfil route? Um, and then when can we do a reattack? What type of weaponeering are we using to mitigate? Um, because in, in Mosul, uh, we had some collateral damage, um, you know, concerns here and there. Um, but a lot of it was that the contact with ISIS and either the Iraqi federal police or whoever was advising them was so close that when they were calling from air support, some of our nine lines were like super danger close. Um, in Mosul specifically, I dropped a 38 that was 33 meters away from the friendlies. So a 500 that is so close. Yeah, it's insane, right? So, and it happened to be that particular drop um happened i think a month later you know um where there was a friendly unit that was in one like house essentially and then isis was in the house next door and they were separated by about seven feet or so and they were trading grenades with each other and the iraqis had gotten to the point where they were uh, out of ammo and stuff. And so the JTAC, who's an American JTAC and who's dislocated um, using a PRED to update the uh, position called uh, the strike on the other building. And he said that they were, you know, he was south 33 meters. And I was like, man, that's a, uh, you know, it's pretty tight. So had mitigated that by delaying the fuse a little bit so that it would, uh, we delayed about 50 milliseconds or so went through the house, ended up blowing up, you know, and they were fine. Um, they had to have had some sort of like concussion damage or something, you know, to that effect, but we ended up next door. Uh, you're saying like the friendly yeah. next door. Yeah. Cause it, what yeah. does delaying the fuse do? Could you share? Yeah. So, um, if you have a, uh, no delay on the fuse, so like an instantaneous, then the first thing that that bomb hits, uh, whether it's the uh, top of a, a roof or whatever, the bomb is going to go off. If you delay the fuse, the bomb is going to penetrate the amount of time that you delay it. So if you have a 15 millisecond or a five millisecond delay, when the bomb hits, say the top of a roof, it's gonna wait five milliseconds or 15 milliseconds to then detonate. And so what that can do for you is that it can mitigate some of the blast so that um, if you need to like bury the bomb and it blows up, the frag pattern is usually a little bit smaller. 
Um, so we can do that. Um, and then with JDMs or the um, GPS guided bombs, we can also control uh, what impact angle it hits at as well. Um, so that can usually mitigate some of the effects of what we call a, a circular error probable um, uh, miss distance. So basically how far the bomb is spec for to be accurate. Um, and so the steeper flight path angle that you have, the more accurate the bomb is, the lower flight path angle that you have, the less accurate it is. Um, but there's some cases where you would want to use a low impact angle. Um, so, but we had gotten, uh, we had gotten a few interesting drops. Um, and then, I mean, it ended up being probably every sortie we had cleaned off the jet. So we were like, we're like you're, you're going Winchester or whatever you, you would say, like your weapons yeah. are out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by the end of the deployment, it dropped something like 300 bombs or something. So, and I would say about half of those were danger close. Jeez. Hey, what, yeah. so can you talk about what's going through your mind when you're asked to do a danger close and do you have to get initials for it? Yeah, that's right. So as you go through the, uh, a nine line, which is kind of a standard format for doing close air support, um, anything that's danger close or within the, the risk estimation distance, uh, to the friendly forces, um, you're going to have to get the ground commander's initials and, uh, they'll, they'll usually preempt the nine line with that. And the cool thing was that, um, you, as we traveled to various places and covered different types of ticks, we worked with different JTACs and the JTACs that we worked with up in Raqqa were the best JTACs I've ever had the privilege of working with. And I ended up meeting up with some of those guys later on in life, but they were the cool, and they were tier one guys from a specific unit. Um, and they were just awesome. They were so good. And I remember being on the same shift. So we would fly lines where you kind of on the same, um, uh, time, you know, pattern or whatever. And so we would be working with essentially the same guys uh, normally. So we could voice recce them. Uh, and then we knew exactly, who, and they knew us, we knew them. They were very comfortable. We got to a point, you know, kind of by the end of the uh, deployment where you could almost read each other's minds about what they needed when they needed it, what they were willing to accept risk wise, um, and then how fast you needed to act. And you could almost get to a point where you could tell uh, what their voice uh, sounded like, the frequency range of their voice to be able to how urgent what they were asking for, you know, uh, which is which is super cool. Um, and uh, we had done done some pretty cool drops. Uh, one of them in Raqqa was a, uh, some guys were taking some super effective fire. They were, um, important people and, um, they were pinned down from a dishka and the, uh, a dishka, uh, a heavy machine gun. And the dishka was coming from the third story of a seven story apartment building. And they were pinned down into like this rock wall and it was just busting out the wall. And I could see in the target pod, I could see muzzle flashes and I could see it, you know, busting out the wall. And the JTAC, and I, I could hear it in the background. Uh, he said, you know, we need to get this thing, <laughs> you know, taken care of. Um, he said, hey, it's going to be a type 2 BOT or bomb on target. Um, Seven-story apartment building, or the uh, third story of a seven-story apartment building across the street, blah, 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 you know, got it in the, okay, tally target. Uh, and we had designated, you know, dead center on it. And what we had used was, um, because it was so far down in the apartment building, we needed a bomb that could penetrate. And so we had these things called GBU-31 and V3s, which was a 2000 pound bomb, but had a hardened case. So it could actually penetrate through, um, you know, multiple stories. And if you time the fuse right, um, so we we timed it to be about, you know, 35 milliseconds or so, um, that you could blow out that story that that dude was on with the Dishka. And, you know, Colin with heading expect clearance on final, like, yep, you know, dude's in, uh, 180 clear hop. Uh, so we ended up, uh, dropping and then we blew that third story out within like maybe a minute and a half or two minutes of getting that nine line. Dude. And, uh, you know, it ended up working out, you know, pretty good. Um, but, uh, but stuff like that, you're, you're a little hesitant to do fast because, uh, guys normally when it comes to nine lines, uh, will make mistakes when they go faster and you really want to save the day and you really want to be the guy who, you know, takes care of it. But at the same time, if you do make a mistake, like you, you'll never be able to take that back. You know what I mean? If you blow those dudes up, like you can't get that bomb back. 
Um, but what you can is you can take a couple more seconds and figure out, am I absolutely hundred percent sure we're visual friendly is right now? Do those coordinates make sense? And so one of the advantages of having a Wizzo in the back seat is the ability to kind of take a Zen moment real quick from not flying the jet and just focus on grids, battle tracking, where stuff is at. Um, and, and you probably know from, you, you guys fly at two place, you know, air 100%. Yep. I, yeah. I don't know how they do it. Single seat, like managing the, like you were talking about the radios, just that, like we could do a whole podcast talking about <laughs> what it's like when the radios are insane. And, and just, you talked about the stack, the insanity on the ground, the air to air comms, like how you do that in, in a single seat seems crazy. And you're going that direction, right? I mean, I don't know if we could talk about it here, but F 35 for you next. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it'll be, it, it'll be cool to get back. And from what I hear the F 35 does a lot of Wizzo stuff too. So, you know what I mean? Cause it's, uh, there's a lot more automated systems in the jet that, that take care of tasks for you, uh, which is, which is super cool. Um, but yeah, so the, the whole, you know, uh, Syria and Iraq thing was, was super cool. We ended up, we actually ended up shooting a M120 as well, um, at a, uh, um, some, it was a long story, but, uh, this Iranian drone was shooting at an ODA team. Uh, and so we ended up, uh, you know, shooting it down. It was a long story. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I, I could probably tell you that, uh, over a beer because okay. that, that involves some crazy stuff, but, um, the, uh, so that's an air to air takedown. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so that, that was kind of cool. It was a Shahid, uh, uh, 129, Shahid 129, uh, drone that had these little mini, uh, hellfires on it. And, um, the ROE was very hazy at the time because we had dudes who were in Syria. We weren't at war with Iran. Um, and so it's not like you can just start you know, there it was just blasting, you know, you can't, you can't do that. Um, so we needed in order to execute, you know, everybody has the right inherent right to self-defense. And so you have a self-defense ROE that you can use. Um, and, uh, and so we were, we, we executed based on that, but, but, but even that super, if there's any gray place in the world, it's Syria and Iraq, as far as who's friendly, who's not, who's a gray player, who's, who's shooting at you, but you're not at war with. And then is that, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. So you had captains um, and lieutenants that were making these strategic decisions about stuff, which was nuts about whether or not to shoot down the Russians or whether or not to shoot down the Iranians or, you know, whatever. And um, we had one particular hairy event, which um, was over uh, Deir Azor. Uh, it was a, there's a broken layer about 17,000 feet ish It was kind of scattered to broken. And, um, it was at night we were supporting a troops in contact. Um, again, it was danger close troops in contact. We were lazing in GB 12s. And so, uh, I'm kind of in the weeds on the ground and the ground and I'm talking to the J attack and the front seater is working the air to air radar and he picks up a strike train of Russian fighters and, um, the Russians had. Sorry, Ryan. What's a strike train when you say that? Uh, strike train, just multiple Russian fighters that are headed towards. It looks like they're headed to bomb something. Uh, we just, you know, call it a strike train or whatever. Uh, but uh, so the Russians are duking it out in Deir Ezzor proper uh, with the Syrians against ISIS, and we're on the other side of the Euphrates River. Um, so. Um, you know, we have guys on the ground, a Green Beret team on the ground as well. So they're, you know, um, so we're, we're, we're dealing with the troops in contact uh, with those guys. And the soft agreement with the Russians was, you know, they're going to stay on their side of the river. We're going to stay on our side of the river. And then this is how this is going to go down. So the Russians had started dropping weapons from these things called Su-34 uh, fullbacks. And... They were kind of, they, I feel like I, I don't want to judge them because I'm not in their cockpit, but I didn't feel like they were super smart uh, because they were using max AB at night, which is illuminating where their aircraft is at to uh, ISIS who's shooting AAA at them with 57 millimeter anti-aircraft fire. So we're starting to see airburst AAA kind of near and around our position, which we don't want, you know, um, and these Russian guys are, are starting to drop unguided weapons and the unguided weapons are not 
staying on their side of the river. They're dropping them on their side of the river, but they're going on our side. And we start to see explosions from the Russians uh, near our guys. And they were about 600 meters away from our U.S. team. So we're trying to figure out, are the Russians, did the Russians just start like World War III? Are they trying to bomb our position? And um, the JTAC, uh, you know, he's working super hard with his own stuff, but he just hears explosions going off, but he's not sure who those are. There's an AC-130 in the stack uh, as well. And the JTAC has no idea about the Russians at all, that the Russians are there. And the Russians, like, he's not talking to them on the radio, so they're not minding the deconfliction plan for the stack. They're just flowing right through. They don't care, you know? So we're looking out for them. And uh, so they start dropping closer to the U.S. position. And so we're trying to make a decision. And here we are, just, you know, some dumb captains. And we're like, hey, listen, like, are we going to have to toast these Russian guys? You know, we gonna shoot these guys down or what? And um, so we're, we're having this conversation in the jet, meanwhile, lazing in GB-12's danger close and trying to battle track with this. And the uh, I had tracked a, um, right after I dropped a 12, I went and I, I put the sniper pod into one of the uh, Russian jets and I saw one of the bombs fall. So I, I tracked it in the, in the sniper pod and watched it hit. So I knew it was from the Russians. There was no question about it, that this bomb was from the Russians and they had you know dropped it and stuff. But the bomb fall line from the Russians had almost hit an AC-130 who was in the stack, who was below. Wow. And so the AC-130 pilot had, uh, and the radios are just blowing up with stuff, right? AC-130 pilot thinks the arty is hot, the friendly arty is hot, and it was just an arty that went by, and the JTAC saying that arty is cold, and there's just like this whole calm thing that's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. And then we're on, uh, so we're on the ground frequency and we have three radios in the jet. So we're also on the air to air frequency with the uh, AWACS for the early morning. And they're talking about the Russians and they're trying to get an ID. So the front seat pilot is trying to coordinate. He said, Hey, let's do a headbutt," which is basically saying that we're going to get super close to the Russians and we're going to try to fly right in front of them to try to cut them off from their next attack run so that they kind of peel off and then they go on their side of the river. And it's kind of a way of saying like, don't come around here anymore. Um, and usually how risky is that move, Ryan? Uh, extremely like, and it was more risky than we thought it was going to be. Uh, we underestimated it because the Russians had, um, pretty advanced, uh, jamming and we had these old, older radars in that jet. We didn't get the radar upgrade yet. And um, they were jamming the radar, the radar pretty solid, and it was IMC type stuff. So we're going to do a headbutt in IMC at night with a radar that's being jammed, which is you know you're taking crazy pills at that time. Oh, by the way, there's AAA that's going off and air bursting, so you're getting spatially disoriented by the flashes of light because it's going up to the clouds and it's uh, lighting up a cloud right as you're you know as you're going on. So. Um, so we do that. We headbutt this Su-34 and he, it looks like we shook him up or something. I, I don't know, but he peels off because you're not talking to him on the radio. He peels off from the attack run. His escort, which is a Su-30, which is an air to air, you know, fighter is not super happy with us at the time because of that. Cause it looks like from the flares and the air bursting everywhere, they're not sure if we're shooting at them or not. So they lock us up and spike us, and uh, which means that they have a uh, essentially, for all intents and purposes, a weapons quality track on us with their missiles, and we're pointed at them at night. And everybody's lights out at this point, by the way, so you're just sensor SA only. And so uh, AWACS is a little bit behind on what's going on, and they just call a furball on the radio, which means that all fighters are merged and they can't track who's who. Uh, so, uh, which was not super helpful comment at the time, but Hey, whatever. Um, it was kind of cool actually, because F 22s were down in the South doing DCA and they were listening to the radio and they, they were super excited that all this stuff was going on and they're, they said they, they could be there any minute, you know, and stuff. And, uh, and anyways, so we, uh, we locked this guy up as well and we just point at him and he points at us and we end up merging at about 200 feet. Uh, at night, lights out, and I can feel his uh, afterburners vibrate on the canopy as he goes by. Like that's how close he was. And I had MVGs on, and I had ripped them off prior to the merge out of 
habit patterns so they don't like fall on your nuts, you know, when you pull a lot of G's. So I ripped them off to grab onto them. And uh, we we merged with them. And the pilot in the front seat uh, that I was fine with, this guy, Smack Tack, who was a, just a great guy, um, he ends up just thinking, I don't know what crossed his mind or why he thought this, but it was pure genius. He pulls it out of Max AB. We were initially in Max AB. He pulls it out of Max AB. Which what is Max the, AB? Uh, max Afterburner. Okay. So you want to have an energy advantage, the max you can, you know, uh, so he pulls it out of max AB because it caused the Russian fighter to lose visual on us after we merged. And we could see his burner plumes as he turned around and he lost his radar gimbaled the lock as we merged, uh, which is great. And he unloaded and our wingman ended up locking him up, which I think startled him that he wasn't, he had lost essay about where we were at. And we could see him unload, which means that, you know, he pushes the stick forward uh, and he goes across the river. And we had another Russian fighter who had locked up. Uh, it looked like he was targeting, you know, the AC-130. And we weren't sure, like, what was going to happen. Yeah. And uh, so we ended up getting him to break, um, you know, break lock and go back. And and AWACS had said, you know, you know, if you think it's self-defense, you're clear to engage, you know, and stuff. And we're like, what, you know? And so it's just like crazy thing happens, you know? And you're like, I don't know, there's something inside. You're like, man, we can de-escalate the situation or we can just escalate it, you know, insanely. And, and we, we, we decided that de-escalation was the best way forward because the mission that we were doing was uh, counter ISIS stuff. And we were in Syria at the time and there was a lot more going on and we, like there, there wasn't really a need to shoot down the Russians at that point in time. That now the situation has been like kind of diffused a little bit. Uh, and then we were going to try to see what they can do about contacting them and telling them about, you know, not dropping bombs near our guys. But um, it was, it was definitely a gut check of how close are you to comfort about what's going on. And so, you know, that whole debacle ends and we get back and we're, we're landing at, at dawn essentially uh, back there. And then the, uh, the operations group commander, the 06, uh, and then the wing commander come meet us at the jet. And they're like, we need to see your tapes ASAP. And they thought that we had caused something and we were at fault. And then they were able to get some of the lines and stuff and put together the video and we had to brief them. And, and they were like, oh, well, yeah, actually, yeah, thanks for, you know, not starting World War Three and all this other stuff. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. So the yeah, international but, incident you like that you could have been involved in is insane. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was interesting, uh, for sure. Um, but we had, we'd also, you know, popped the cherry when we shot down the, uh, the Iranian drone. Um, so that was like the first air to air. Um, it was the first air to air AMRAM employment of the strike Eagle. Um, and, uh, that, that whole story, was kind of weird um how it all happened and uh we ended up um well it, it was cool because you know you shoot an amram which is cool you know uh but uh anyways you blow something up that's live with a live warhead in the air and it's cool because it you know blows up everywhere and stuff and um anyways that that instance had happened where um you know dudes were taking fire on the ground or they, they had taken a a Iranian hellfire to uh, one of their vehicles and it had dudded surprisingly. And we were trying to, we had a kind of a complex situation starting bouncing around from story to story, but uh, no, this is good, man. This is great. we had kind of have a complex problem to solve because the um, we, we definitely wanted to protect the guys on the ground, obviously, you know, and if you ask us, we, we love shooting stuff down air to air, you know, that'd be, it's great. But th there's also like you, you have to, you have to put your cool hat on for a second and figure out ROE and figure out, okay, you know, we, we, we kind of use what we call the, the BBC rule or the bitch be cool rule, you know, from, uh, from Pulp Fiction. Uh, and so <laughs> you tone down and you think to yourself, um, okay, like what exactly is going on? And am I going to make a super rash decision that I can't take back? No, I need to act. And then I go back to that lifeguard moment where I told you where I didn't act. You think, is inaction going to get somebody killed right now? Or is inaction going to be the problem? 
you know, do I need to act? So the, the Iranian drone one was a, I need to act now. And um, we had spotted it and tracking them was a little bit difficult, but in any case, uh, so the Russians had been sniffing around us during this event that was going on and they saddled up behind us at 6,000 feet. So this Russian fighter basically was 6,000 feet. So one mile behind us. So we're in, we're basically held at gunpoint by this Russian fighter as we're, we locked up this Iranian drone that looked like it was circling back around to attack this, uh, um, ODA team. And, uh, we told our wingmen to lock up the other Russian, the Russian fighter that was locking us up. And then another Russian fighter locked him up. So it's this big Mexican standoff there. And we were a little bit concerned because if a missile flew off our jet, is the Russian dude going to just start blasting? You know what I mean? And last thing we want to do is, you know, get burned alive in a cage or something like that uh, from having to eject, you know? And, Ryan, uh, is that a discussion you have in the cockpit before you pull the trigger? Uh, sort of. Uh, we, I, I feel like we're, we're more, we're a little bit more on the same page about, um, I don't know. I, I think I was a little bit more leaning forward about we need to do this like right now. Uh, and we actually have to shoot this thing right now. And there's no question about it. Um, so uh, we ended up uh, getting into a position where we, we were also concerned that the thing was going to blow up and it was going to rain down a bunch of hot debris over this ODA team, which is going to be the equivalent of, you know, it, it wasn't going to be good. So we had to kind of wait or line our geometry up to where we could shoot it down, but it was going to fall into the desert without get, without it getting into a weapons employment zone for its hellfires. It, it's kind of hard to explain, but uh, so we try to make it happen. And then so Taxi 2 comes on the radio and says, <laughs> um, don't engage. And we're like, uh, I think we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> and they're like, nope, don't do it. And uh, we we're like, well, why not? And uh, so, like, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're working something else. Uh, Is that the AWACS? Is that taxi? Uh, it, it, it was, yeah. And then we had, okay. we, we had some other assets around and um, we, we said, well, whatever you're doing is not working. So like, we're going to shoot this thing. And so we decided we had an inner cockpit conversation. We said, you know what, this falls under self-defense ROE, screw it. Master I'm hot, you know? And so, um, you know, we ended up shooting this thing and, you know, we call it a splash and everything. Uh, and, um, anyways, uh, there, there's more to that story, you know, on the way back, um, uh, that I, I will definitely tell you over a beer, but, uh, as we're getting back, we're, we're bingo, super bingo. We're on our second bingo, which you're only allowed to have one bingo, you know, uh, we're almost out bingo. of fuel, right? Yeah, exactly. Super out of fuel, like emergency divert profile gas, you know, and we get back and I remember distinctly landing and taxiing to what we call EOR, which is the end of the runway where we had de-arm crews that de-arm all the weapons for you while you're running before you shut down. And um, I remember them looking up at the wing pylon and seeing that there was an AMRAM missing. And they were just, they thought, you could tell on their face, they thought it had fallen off or something like that. They had no idea that it had been shot off. They, had, they thought that they screwed up somehow and it just like came off the rail and landed in the middle of the desert, right? So uh, they we told them, no, 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 it was fine. It worked fine, you know, and... Um, they, uh, anyways, taxi back to the ramp, you know, and, and it was all good, all good from there. Uh, but I, I do remember the, so whenever you shoot an AMRAM, uh, the jet has a little delay to it where it sends a, uh, built-in test, uh, to the AMRAM and it takes about a second for it to come off the rail after you press the pickle button. And I remember, uh, you know, the pickle button being pressed, uh, in the front cockpit. And, um, I remember looking at the pylon and thinking, I can't believe it. That dumb AMRAM isn't going to work that, you know, and had all these thoughts about it. And then it just flew off the rail, you know, it's like, okay, cool. I guess it works. Um, so, uh, so that was that. And, um, you know, we end up, you know, going back and, and, uh, talking about it and everything. And, uh, there were some things that went wrong, uh, during the whole entire engagement, uh, and then some things that went right. Um, but it was a big learning experience, I think for, for everybody overall. So how'd you feel about it that night? Like when you finally got to like done with the AAR, however you discussed a debrief, you're in your, I don't know where you're based at the time. doesn't matter. Like you go back to your bed 
how are you thinking about that night? Like you almost, uh, you air to air shoot down Iranian um, aircraft that took a shot on an ODA team, Russians tailing you, the chaos on the radio, like what's going through your head uh, as you try to get to sleep? Yeah. So honestly, uh, as we came back and, and normally we, we actually land and we, I remember debriefing this, uh, cause we, you know, the, one of the things about the fire community is you always debrief everything that you do, uh, in detail. And I, I remember we had a couple lawn chairs out by this tree and that was like our debrief spot, which is, you know, not super secure, I guess, but, um, we, uh, we talked about it and I just remember being so disappointed in myself and disappointed in us for not acting quicker. And I was really mad that the Iranian had taken that shot at him because our mission was defensive counter air. And uh, like we were, we were responsible for protecting those guys. And the ROE was at a point in time where it, it, it was so gray and so weird. And a lot of things were not defined um, that we you know, had to, had to try to figure out some pretty complex scenarios, uh, uh, how to act and when to act. And it was never clear cut. And I feel like, um, a lot of times when you talk about combat, everything seems very, uh, black and white and, you know, I needed, I needed to do this right now. And I, you know, knew it, but, um, from the ROE perspective and gray, when you're, you know, dudes are in Syria and this isn't our airspace, we're in this other country, we're not at war with this country, you know, and, um, it, it's, it's difficult to draw a line and it, and it makes you study a lot, of, into warfare, into, um, how war, uh, begins and ends and all the nuances of everything else and encourages you to, you know, read more about the profession of arms and be better so that when you're a leader, you can offer more clear guidance to people and get them to understand and so as, as I was, you know, going to sleep that night, I was, I was a little bit more disappointed in everything. And, uh, we ended up, um, getting a DFC, uh, for that. Um, but it was never like a, I, I don't know. I, I always felt like we could have done it a lot better, you know? Um, Man. so Man, I, can't, I can't imagine a scenario in that fog of war where you could have taken a shot before it fired the first hellfire unless you knew it was about to fire, like given the, the international geopolitical stakes at play. Yeah. So I, it was really weird. I, I actually had a feeling that it was going to, um, and I can't tell you how I knew that, but like, you're just weird sixth sense of how you see events going and you just kind of know. And I just, I just kind of knew because I remember looking at it in the pod, like right before and seeing that it had hellfires and, and seeing that it was just, there's something, I don't know, something that, that spoke to me in a really weird way. Uh, but, but you, you can't, you know, go up to a lawyer and say, well, you know, I had this funny feeling. And, uh, so I exactly lasting, you know, <laughs> you can't. Yep. So, uh, and, but, but at the same time, like, you know, the dude who's on the ground, who's the, you know, ODA guy, like, I, I don't, I don't want anything to happen to him, you know? And, uh, and, and those guys are, have a hard enough job as it is, uh, down there, you know, c c they would come to our base every once in a while. And so we, we chatted with them and they had their own, uh, challenges and I respect the shit out of those guys. Um, and I wish we could have, um, I wish we could have been better, you know, uh, in that. And I wish we could have done it sooner and they wouldn't have had to have been exposed because really we were at the mercy of luck at that point of that, uh, munition dudding um because otherwise that would have been you know the first um had that had gone off and had killed a u.s um service member that would have been the first enemy aerial attack fatality since 1953 and that would have been wow. like in our dca cap <laughs> so you know you don't want to go down for in history as that guy you know um so uh so that that's kind of what we uh you know what we were thinking and um, so it was, it was interesting. It was a great, crazy time. Let me, let me ask you this. And I, I know I got to get you out of here soon. <laughs> this this is super interesting to me, Ryan. Um, I've talked to a lot of guys on this show, 110 vets, right? 
a lot of them, most of them have finished their time in service. Sometimes we'll talk about the point where you along the way realize like I might die doing this job. And it's easy to say when we're sitting at home and we know we don't have to go out and fly again or go out to the flood again. Have you had this moment where you're like, this might be it today? Like, how do you wrestle with that, if at all? Yeah, um, actually, that moment happens a lot more often than not. Um, sometimes you, if if you've had a lot of friends um, in aviation, even, you know, and you you know people that have packed it in, you know, uh, it happens. And you get into scary situations where you're like, man, these have all the ingredients to die, you know? <laughs> and I've been way more concerned on that um, on a training level than I have um, or during training in like sketchy weather or, you know, in the mountains, uh, pitch black on MVGs or, you know, whatnot than I have in combat. Because I remember some combat stuff and I remember specifically, you know, strafing I remember looking in the target pod and the dude had a ZPU in the back of a truck and he was shooting up at us and we were strafing and I was like, huh, that's what it looks like when someone's shooting at you. Totally, you know, didn't, didn't really think too much of it. And similarly with, you know, AAA stuff, you know, oh, that's what AAA actually looks like. Hmm. You know, no, never thought any of that, you know, would actually happen. But then some of the training stuff you get in and you know, especially, and you've seen this, right? When you get into, you know, uh, icy weather, shooting instrument approaches with degraded systems, uh, et cetera. And you're like, man, this reads like a safety board investigation. Like this is how this starts because you've heard hundreds of safety briefs, read a bunch of investigations where dudes have hit a mountain because they had low SA or, had, um, you know, otherwise packed it in or hit another aircraft or whatnot, because it was a momentary lapse in judgment. And when you're strapping into the jet and you're, you're like, man, I am totally aware that I am not the smartest person in the entire world. And any of these, uh, lapses of judgment could happen today. Um, I, I actually think that quite a lot that, Hey, this might be the last time that I ever strap into this jet. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know that's kind of dark, uh, to say, but dude, I, I've, uh, I've definitely, I feel like I've used up my share of luck in life, uh, from flying stuff. So, <laughs> so sooner or later, something's going to happen, you know, man. I mean, just before we started, like you, you talked about, you know, tucking your kid in at night, you know, so yeah. it's easy to sit here when my work is I log into a computer in the morning. And I just know how hard it is what you're doing, man. So, um, I'm just, I mean, I'm jealous. There's a big part of me that's jealous that you're doing this, like the roll call, like being out there, just the fact that you were in this air war, like there are going to be people looking at you like, Oh my God, look at what, the, what Ryan did. That's awesome. But at the same time, like I know the thoughts that go through the, through your head and, and how you make it day to day and with the family, it's no joke. Yeah. The, the, um, that whole perspective on the deployment and stuff was, was kind of surreal because we went back and then, uh, after that I got picked up for pilot training. So I had to go through the whole training pipeline again. Uh, and then it was, it was really weird because you, you, you get into the training portion of the air force where there's like zero combat experience and you're just, I mean, I was fresh from all this stuff. So you're talking to people who, don't necessarily understand, you know, what goes on or what decisions that you had to make. And like, I, I remember one particular event where we had been responsible for doing what's called NTISR or non-traditional um, uh, intelligence and reconnaissance or whatever, or surveillance and reconnaissance. And um, we were looking for VBIDs or vehicle born IDs. And um, it was in Mosul and I saw a garage door open on a house and it was like a minivan rollout and the minivan looked kind of low, but it didn't look too crazy. And, um, I just had a weird sense that I think that was a VBID. And, um, so I told the JTAC, Hey, I got a six digit grid to the next intersection, possible VBID. And I see it speed up. And then, um, the JTAC starts copying down the grid and the 
car goes down a ditch and then goes around to a Iraqi convoy of dudes who are just standing out in the middle and smoking and joking and stuff. And it just blows up within this all happened within about 30 seconds. And it was like, holy shit. And we couldn't have, there's no way we could have even rolled in and dropped the bomb. No way. Much less gotten a nine line and gotten clearance because the time of fall of the weapon versus everything, it just had happened super quick. And I remember watching it went off like a 2000 pound bomb, you know, and dudes, the guys who were standing next, it was these standing next to these Iraqi Hummers. And I, I remember distinctly seeing this car in the pod, you know, driving toward, and they just split. I mean, they just started running, blew up you know, and the radios who were crazy, um, at the time just went silent. And, um, it was just like, everybody just paused for a second, knew, kind of knew what had happened. Um, and then we had, um, you know, made it kind of a big deal to figure out some TTPs to be able to target VBIDs quicker. Um, but then we had some other real, real hard decisions to make because some of the VBIDs look like refugee vehicles that were leaving the city. So then you have a certain amount of time where you're like, well, are you going to target this thing or not? Is it going to be a refugee vehicle or is it going to be a VBID? And um, we ended up figuring out like there's a couple of ways to tell, but it takes like massive amounts of experience that you can't write down in a book about how to tell a VBID from a refugee vehicle, you know? And, uh, and, th and th those were kind of hard hard decisions to make. And then, and then you live with that. Um, and then we end up going through the, the training pipeline again. And so you're, you have all this, you know, experience, I guess, and you're listening to people try to tell you how to do casts or how to tell you do, and who have never dropped a bomb in their entire life ever, you know, and they're trying to tell you like how to do stuff again, you know, and you're like, well, you know, dad and they're like, well, you know, Anyways, so uh, so it, it was an interesting, I found that to be more of an interesting experience coming back through the pipeline uh, than, than not. So it's probably surreal, actually, like the, the amount of knowledge you've now gained. Um, so Ryan, just before we break here, um, mm -hmm. what you, you very quickly mentioned the merge, you just yeah. talk a little bit more about uh, what you do there. Uh, well, I don't really do much anymore uh, with it, but uh, my buddy Paco Benitez, the the grumpy patch that I told you about before, uh, runs it. He's an incredibly smart dude. Uh, it's a defense newsletter um, that uh, just tries to make sense of like uh, defense stuff, especially acquisition related decisions, and fill everybody in on you know what's going on as far as uh, kind of the inside baseball on defense. Uh, which is really helpful to people who are nerding out and or in that community or whatnot. So it's the, the merch.co, um, you sign up for the newsletter. He also runs a podcast called the merge. Um, so we, uh, every once in a while, um, he'll get some pretty interesting people on there and, and chat and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So you've seen this podcast before two questions I try to ask everybody. Is there anything you carry with you when you're flying that has sentimental value, something that someone gave you that you just want to have on you? Uh, actually there, there is, and there was, um, I had a, uh, a Breitling that we had bought, um, you know, as a squadron and that was a, um, splurge, uh, but in the, all great fighter pilots have nice watches is like a thing, right? So we had a Breitling and uh, I carried that into every sortie that I ever flew, um, in the Strike Eagle into combat and everything. And I wanted it to be kind of a passer downer sort of item. Um, and also it's helpful because if you do get shot down somewhere, at least you have an expensive watch that you can try to buy your way out, you know, somewhere. So, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I carried for the most part. You still got it. I still have. Yeah. I it's, uh, it's in the other room, but uh, I would show it to you, but it, it looks no, like all good. Each Breitling. The way you mentioned it, you said like you had, I, I just didn't know if you had lost it along the way. Oh, still, still wear it every day. It doesn't keep as good of time anymore, but I still wear it. Okay. And then I think people might think that this is a throwaway question, but you know, I always ask, would you go back and do it again? You could theoretically step out at any time. You could have made different choices along the way. I guess my question to you, Ryan, since you're still serving is, 
Like when you decided to sign up and go this route, if you could go back to that time, would you have chosen a different route or would you have gone in and done this again? Um, part of me would have liked to have taken a much more direct route, you know, to get in. Uh, but then I would, I don't know if I would have had the same experiences um, that I had doing that. And um, I think that the experiences that I had um, were helpful. And uh, I learned stuff along the way that I would never give up. Um, and I think that that's part of the journey. So I would do it, you know, exactly how I did it um, over again. I, I would have no problem, no problem doing that. It'd be very painful to do it over again, but I would do it. And then uh, j just one more question for you. If sure. let's say we sat down 10 or 15 years from now, what would you want your story to be for those next 10 to 15 years? Like, what do you see coming? What do you want it to be like? Well, I'd like to still be alive for for one. Agreed. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to be, you know, I don't want some airport named after me or something, you know, but uh, I, uh, I would want to, you know, somebody to look back and just, you know, even if they didn't know my story or, or they did, but just say, you know, what, you did it right. And, uh, you know, served, did a good job serving um, and, uh, and was there when people needed them. And, uh, and that was it, you know, I, I, yeah. Do you still want to be like, do you think you'll be in the air force 15 years from now? And you don't have to answer if, uh, Ooh, if you feel like, years, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've been in like 12 so far. So, um, I think, I, you know, I don't think 15 years, maybe, I, I think maybe, you know, maybe push it out to, you know, eight more years or something, but, but yeah, who knows, man. Ryan, this was this was super fun. Like I, I love nerding out on the <laughs> aviation stuff. I think people are going to really appreciate the decision making challenges that you faced. Uh, I don't think people really realize what that's like. And over the air, like just over the ground there in Syria, Iraq, those decisions are just incredible to hear. So thanks so much, man, for for taking the time for this. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that combat story as much as I did. Jumping into some listener comments here. First is from Frank4871 on YouTube, and he's talking about the Steve Lapping interview. If you recall, Steve Lapping's a longtime 160th um, AH and MH6 pilot. And he says, remember the wrist-worn Garmin GPSs they gave us? I kept mine upside down on my kit so I could just look down at any time I needed to. I love that thing. And I just, I chose this one because I just love it when when vets listen to this and it brings back some of their own memories of just the little things that they used to do, the kit that they had on them, literally. So really, really interesting. I appreciate you saying that. The next one is from Hamsta9578 on YouTube. It's uh, about the, the Wiz um, interview, right? So talking to FAA team Matt Wiz Buckley. He says, Ryan, dang, captivating, engaging, enjoyable, informative, and powerful as always. And then he goes on to say, and this is a little more somber, but important. He says, having lost one of my deepest best friends to suicide a few years ago was a game changer. It's very well managed now, but I still kick my own butt for not seeing the horizon more clearly, not doing even more, not putting everything on hold to help her. High performance, high pressure, world champion athlete. When it happened, I compartmentalized and tapped a few bad habits until I pulled myself up by the bootstraps and engaged proper self help. One of the recurring themes we see in your interviews, as we did with Wiz, is how special ops operators and critical mission aviators are truly hardwired with the ethos of commitment, loyalty, service before self, and never quit. Thanks for sharing that. I know, I mean, just reading it, I can tell how emotional and tough it is. So thank you for sharing. And I'm glad that it comes through here. And, and you are not alone. We're all fighting this. And I think we're all worried about the next phone call we get of somebody we knew who might be uh who might have taken their own life so thank you uh thank you for sharing for listening thank you all of you for sticking it out this long i really love this particular combat story and if you love this in the cockpit go check out our interview with kim casey killer chick campbell uh a10 fighter pilot it's another great one um of what it's like inside the cockpit thanks y'all stay safe